I guess I'll just do a quick little countdown here. Okay. And uh, three, two, and one. So today on the Modern Military History Podcast, we have a really special guest, John Stryker Meyer, Vietnam veteran, veteran of SOG. And um, I'm going to let him do his own introduction. Uh, I'm certainly not going to do it for you. Uh, John, tell us a little bit about uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Well, good morning. You Thank you. Yeah, uh, a few a few years ago, actually uh, 53 years ago, there was a little war going on in Vietnam. I flunked out of college and then um, enlisted in the army. So I have an opportunity to uh, try out for the special forces at that time, the Green Berets. And so long story short, um, after uh, enlisting, went through basic training at Fort Dix, advanced infantry training up at uh, uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. And there we went through the testing, the written, psychological, physical testing. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, what, year, what year did you enlist? I enlisted uh, December 1st, 1966, and um, we went, and that's when I enlisted right then, went in, went to basic training at Fort Dix, sure. and then uh, up to, down to Fort Gordon, Georgia for uh, March and April of 67, mm-hmm. went through jump school at, at Fort Benning, Georgia. 1967, May 67. Gotcha. And then from there, straight to Fort Bragg, North Carolina to begin special forces training. And we had phase one, our MOS training, our military job, which in my case was uh, uh, communications. We did Morse code back then. Yes. And uh, field exercises. Then we had a, a temporary duty uh, training before we went to Vietnam and radio teletype. Landed in Vietnam at the end of uh, April 1968, had in-country training that went into May. And uh, at the end of it, a little guy came out and said, we're looking for volunteers for a project. My old buddy, Johnny McIntyre said, what project? He said, you can't say either you're in or you're out. (laughs) Well, at that time, the movie, The Green Berets had been out for a while. And so, in fact, we just saw it. In the train. So he said, what would the Duke do? The Duke would go to, what would he would the Duke sign do? up. Yeah. So we signed up. And uh, a couple of days later, we were up in Da Nang. We were introduced to the secret war. And they had a signed document saying we couldn't and wouldn't talk about it yeah, for 20 yeah. years. From the date that we signed it. Yeah. If we did talk about it, we could be prosecuted federally. So we signed the documents, had the briefing. Uh, went up to we got assigned to food buy up at FOB one, mm-hmm. and we had a harsh introduction to the secret war. When we got off our helicopters, a recon team got on, went into a target in Laos, and they disappeared. Never been heard from since. The two Americans, Glenn Lane and Robert Owen, are amongst the fifty plus Green Berets who are still listed today as missing in action from the secret war. And uh, so there was an opening in recon. Yeah. So uh, harsh way to get a harsh way to get an opening. That's a hard way. Yes, Yes, indeed. So um, with that, Spider Parks became the team leader. I knew him from training group. He had been on Idaho, had been promoted to his own team. But when Idaho got wiped out, he was a natural choice to be a team leader. Don Wolkel became the assistant team leader, and then I became the radio operator from the American side. And fortunately, we had experienced Vietnamese, Nguyen Van Sao, who had been running missions across the fence for over two years. He didn't go on that faithful mission, so we had his expertise. He was the Vietnamese counterpart to Spider. Wow. And they worked closely together on, uh, on the team. And then Hep was the interpreter, and, you know, any combat situation like that in training, an interpreter is just critical. Mm. And Hep spoke four or five languages. Sometimes he would correct my English even. And that was and the, uh, uh, if I if I remember correctly, the original um, genesis for special forces was to go in, work with indigenous troops, um, train up indigenous forces, 
um, and, and do do the kind of work where, you know, you are working through interpreters and whatnot. Am I am I reading in or am I have I uh, surmised that original conception of the special forces? Uh, no, you correctly? Give it very accurate. Surmise. Gotcha. And the the Green Beret motto is de oppresso libera to free the oppressed. And um, now you said you you had joined the army and then it wasn't until 68 that you went to Vietnam. Um, what I'm, what comes up for me is, uh, when did you decide to go special forces? Did you join, um, from the beginning with the idea of going special forces or was there something along the way after enlistment? Um, no, no, I, I enlisted for it, but gotcha. in, in 19, in 1966, the only way you could enlist for it was to enlist airborne on a sign. That's the official mm -hmm. designation. And then once you're in, like when we went through advanced infantry training, then they came out and asked for volunteers. So we right. volunteered. And then there was a bunch of us that went through the battery of tests, physical, et cetera. Mm. And then uh, once we passed that, then uh, we received orders to go directly to jump school. And once we graduated from jump school, then you went right up to Bragg, got started training there in special forces. What got you interested initially in SF? Um, you know, the, the first real thing, and I mean, I'm, I'm a young guy here in the, mo in, in, in the 21st century. The first thing I ever really came into contact was the Duke in, you know, the Green Berets. But you said you hadn't seen that until you got into country. What Correct. was it that, that like planted that seed initially for you to go SF? Well, there was a book. The book was called The Green Berets oh. by Robin Moore. Books. Who reads? Who reads anymore? No, I love this. Yeah, well, well, back then, there was, and I'm not the only guy that did that. There's yes. a lot of people who, uh, at that point in life, um, young and dumb, yes. read the book and said, hey, if I go, we want to go with these guys if we qualify. And then the next challenge was to go through the training and uh, fortunate to uh, get through it successfully and to move on from there. What did you notice about the kind of guys that um, you began to meet, you began to train with, who decided to go SF. What what did you like? What um, commonalities did you find with this uh, generation of guys who were joining the army during Vietnam, um, looking to go SF, looking to take that jump? What what were there any things um, that made those guys stand out to you? Was there anything that you noticed they had in common with you? What was, what was that <laughs> applicant pool like? Well, once once we really got going, I mean, there were, there were uh, first of all, they're usually a bunch of wise asses. They're very smart. Yes. Um, and they and they were unorthodox. You know, they were people that were inclined to think outside of the box mm -hmm. instead of living in the box. Mm -hmm. And yes. um unconventional warfare was was blooming at that time it was something that oh yeah you know it was something that president kennedy had stressed how important it was mm -hmm. to have uh special operations forces that could address that do you think that and special forces with their lineage that went back to the oss mm. and during world war ii with the jedberg teams working with indigenous personnel there against the nazis first and then somebody like Jack Singlob, who, when he was at UCLA during World War II, he was in ROTC mm -hmm. and he became a Jedburg. He was behind enemy lines in Europe when VE Day, Victory in Europe, came in May of 45. The OSS flew him to Manchuria, where he signed up for uh, details there. And uh, he was able to go in and free over 100 POWs that the Japanese were going to execute. And Jack then went on to the Korean War. In the secret war in Vietnam, he was the uh, officer in charge for two years. Was so that Chief Sog? Career. Say again? Was, that, uh, was he Chief Sog? Is that what was Chief that Sog. his title? Chief Correct. Sog. Okay. From April 66 until August of 1968. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was his heritage that um and people like him that influenced special forces with the a camp the traditional uh, duty assignment in right. vietnam and then of course then we had the sog aspect of it which was detached from the conventional special forces 
and our direct chain of command went right to the White House. So um, what I want to ask is, um, what correlation do you think the nature of the war in Vietnam had with this um, evolution of unconventional warfare? Um, you mentioned Kennedy and uh, his investment in SF. Um, do you, what, 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 in, in other words, what do you think about the kind of war that was being fought in Vietnam? What do you think that that had to do with the, 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 the rise of special forces um, during that time? Um, what do you think about that conflict necessitated that? Well, it was, it was, it was, Kennedy was right on. And by 60, in, in the 60s, uh, there was a, the Cold War was still roaring sure. in Europe. So we had special forces that were in Germany mm -hmm. and worked quietly behind enemy lines, which we never talked about. The first book only came out a few years ago. Right. That was a factual uh, nonfiction book called Dead A, which talked about that Cold War. And we had other uh, countries in Asia, that first special forces group out of Okinawa was involved in training. And again, the thing with special forces is we work with indigenous people to help them to help themselves to improve their livestock mm -hmm. and their lifestyle while helping them to better defend themselves. Right. They're not like France that went in and were a colonial power sure. as a lot of the uh, peace demonstrators in the left wing tends to portray us. Yes. We're there to help those folks help themselves. And it's a really interesting contrast, or excuse me, a comparison to um, currently what's going on, um, efforts in the Middle East, um, efforts where we're using uh, special operations folks to train up um, uh, the Iraqi army, uh, for example, awesome books out right now um, from guys who served in the special forces um, working directly with uh, Afghan National Police, Iraqi National Police, and training them and working with them. Um, so do, do you think that that really had a foundation, what you folks were doing in Vietnam um, in the very beginning there? Oh, clearly. Yeah. And uh, if you talk to any of the special forces men today that are familiar with the history, they'll say that uh, what special forces did in Vietnam, not only SOG, but the A camps and then the other special projects like the Delta, sure. which worked in country and you had the Mike force. Yeah. And the Mike force was designed. Uh, so if an A camp got in trouble, the Mike force would go out and would take the pressure off. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, Jack Tobin, who was in the Mike force, he said, the difference between SOG and the Mike Force was SOG went in and you guys snuck around, tried to be nice and quiet and, and gathered intelligence. We went out and made noise in the jungle and said, come on, we want to fight you, yeah. you cop bastards. <laughs> so you're you're going through the process. You know you want to go SF. Um, you you said that once you joined with this uh, the, with, with SOG, um, at the very beginning, they made you sign non-disclosure. Obviously, therefore, it was highly classified, covert. Um, when you were joining, going through the process, I'm sure you didn't know about SOG. Was there any inclinings that there were covert special operations going on, or was it just totally out of nowhere that you folks were approached with for volunteers for a special project? No, when we went through, uh, there's different phases of training. Sure. So, like, when we were in our MOS training, which is your military occupational status, your job. Mm-hmm. My job was comma. Yes. So both verbal, Morse code, and then later radio teletype. So once we were getting near the end of that training, the instructors knew who were serious. Mm. They knew who was going to stick. And we all, by that time, we had been in the MOS training. In fact, sure. uh, myself and McIntyre and a few others got recycled for Morse code. Okay. Because it was really hard to, uh, to pick it up. But we did, and in answer to your question, sure. we had guys that had been to NAM two and three times. Yeah. They were our instructors. Mm. And so, you know, near the end, they get to know you have a little bit of back and forth with your instructors. And we go, hey, Sarge, what was it like in Vietnam? Yeah. What's that war like over there? And they would give us some little bit of a uh, little advice, things to do, you know, like one of the major things was don't pet a Vietnamese on the head. 
Okay. Because they view that as subservient, something you do only to, to animals. So there's little, these little characteristics. and the Human terrain, yeah. Yes, indeed. And then they said, when you go to Vietnam, get on an A camp, mm -hmm. learn about how it works, because they're going to come out and tell you about a project. Don't do it. Don't go to the projects because that's where people die. Okay. A lot of them. So just to just to explain um, for the audience and um, an A camp, if if I'm getting this correctly, please please. You, are. you know, you just you just come on in and just. I'll barge. Just let me know when I mess up because I've been known to do that. Um, <laughs> I uh, my understanding of the A camps was these are special forces outcropping, so to speak. So they're little camps where SF guys are working with a group of indigenous folks, training them up, working with them, um, running uh, limited scale operations in their area um, across Vietnam. Is that correct? Right. And okay. and um, the, the the A camp would have, the reason why they called it an A camp was there are special forces, the construct of a Green Beret A team is the backbone of special forces. Yes, yes. That's so you my have understanding. An a team, we have a team leader, assistant team leader. There are officers, and today they could be officers or warrant officers. Sure. And then you have five different jobs within that. Mm -hmm. First is intel. You have a medic. And the Green Beret medics are still the best trained medics anywhere in the world today. Mm -hmm. Second to none. Their training is extensive. It's over a year long, even in my day. Okay. And uh, they know how to get it done, how to save people's lives. Then you have weapons, you have demolitions, and then like me, in my case, it was comma. So with a 12-man team, officer, commanding officer, executive commanding officer, then you have two men in each military job. One's the senior and one's the junior. Mm -hmm. And then the senior trains the junior in his MOS. And then once the A team gets set up, they cross-train each other. Mm -hmm. And once they get into a... Uh, an area of operations to their A camp. A lot of the A camps were set up along the border, yes. trying to intervene or monitor traffic coming into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And just to the Ashaw Valley up in I Corps was one of our major infiltration routes. Mm -hmm. And in 65 and 66, we had three Green Beret camps that were simply overrun and wiped out mm -hmm. by the North Vietnamese. And so that it was severe, heavy contact that they're up against, and the and that's uh, the and you, that's the easy duty, so to speak. They're telling you to go to those A camps right. because because the other duties are considered dangerous by comparison. But yet here right. we are, um, by sixty five, sixty six. You say that there are camps being overrun. There's heavy combat up there. So absolutely, did that and, warning from your instructors pique your interest at all in in the the more dangerous by comparison duties that you could possibly encounter in country once you got there. Well, their words were echoing in our heads when, when the recruiter came out for SOG and, but you know, we're young, we'd been in training by that time, 15 months. And it was time, it was time to go do something, right. time to go to war right. on our part, even though by that time the war had been going on for four years. So what was he and like, this guy that, that came out, well, I mean, I'm just curious, what was he like when he showed up and just gave his little spiel? I mean, I'm sure he couldn't have said, hey, I'm, re I'm recruiting for SOG, we're well, doing no, no. covert All operations. Like, I'm sure he didn't say any of that. What was that yeah. like for you? What was it like, that like fish hook that well, got you? The light went on. You know, this is the moment in time yes. you live for. You train 15 months. There's, a, there's something secret going on. Here's your opportunity. Either you're in or you're not. Were you? So we were young and dumb. We're in. We're were you like up. really looking forward to training indigenous guys? I mean, your MOS was Camo, uh, Morse code. Were you thinking, man? You know, I'm gonna get over there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some training guys and working with them on operations. Or did you have in the back of your mind, like, you know, I hear about these other projects and I'm gonna jump on board with one of those as quick as possible? Just curious about your mindset at the time. No, it was. Um... We, we volunteered for for jump school. We volunteered for SF, Special mm -hmm. Forces. And let's go. Let's see what they what's, what's going on. Where can we help? What, right. what Where will they plug us in? Because we knew there's rotations. Um, by 68, most American forces, with the exception of the Marines, 
had a one year rotation. Mm -hmm. So from the day you report it, you would go home in one year. Mm -hmm. You could extend. And the Marine Corps, I think at that time, had 13 month uh, tours of duty. And again, don't quote me on that, but that's okay. So we knew that this was up. So it's our time and we're just going in to see what, what was there and where they wanted us, where they needed us. So you said you and your friend McIntyre are there. And, Mac. Yeah. And, and this, uh, I believe in your, in your book, you describe him as a bantam rooster. He comes in and, and gives his spiel. Um, did you just go with him then? Um, There's or... no spiel. I mean, this thing was so quick. He just came out and said, look, we got a project. We're looking for volunteers. And McIntyre pipes up, you know, for what, Sergeant? And he goes, can't say, either you're in or you're out. And so we volunteered right there. So from there, he says, okay, all you guys have volunteered. I forget. He told us, step outside. Or, and, I said, and then from there, it was, tomorrow you're going to Da Nang. You'll get a briefing there. And then there'll be a final determination as to what will happen to you, where you go, or if you even qualify for the project. Did you stay in a safe house or what, what did you do um, while you were waiting for, for that uh, helicopter up to Da Nang? Oh, well, in the train, we had common barracks. I see. The, the 5th Special Forces Group had a whole area just for training and billets set up. In fact, the first night that we were in country in Vietnam, uh, we got mortared. And the bar two barracks next to us took incoming rounds. They had casualties. And so we got mortared and the debris from the explosions came over to our barracks. And we all ran downstairs to get our weapons to go out to the yeah. uh, perimeter, right? Like they do in any good war movie. Yes. And this was, this is a, a transit barracks. All the guns were locked up. So okay. We just <laughs> went out to the, yeah. Grab a stick. So we, I said, <laughs> well, maybe they don't want us to fight this battle. And then the mortar stopped, we went back and went back to sleep. Welcome to Vietnam. There you go. So you got, next day you go up to Da Nang. Um, what was it like up there? There we had a safe house. What and was that was like? And a safe house is run by, I'm assuming a combination of the agency and special forces. And just to clarify, agency equals CIA. Yes, indeed. Copy that. And... Um, so by a safe house, meaning they provided security, which was 24 seven at that house. They had a front security, people in the back, and um, it was all local troops that they hired, supervised by a Green Beret. Okay. And um, so you could come in there, it was just strictly a barracks, they had food, a bar, and upstairs there was a lot of bunks and things including prostitutes just running around up there did so you it's kinda like what was that like when you what was that like when you walked into the safe house and i mean there's there's prostitutes well, up there we, doing we've their heard thing? about this that there was a little extra attraction so you say so johnny mac and i you know we both had girlfriends back in the states at the time so we're like we're, we're just being good troops here but that's right okay we took our first shower and when i took the shower there's a sergeant in there I jump in, I forget, like four or five shower heads, right? Sure. Good size shower. Yeah. But they're all in the open. And the last one, there was a young lady in a hot squat douching out with uh, Coca Cola. Welcome to Vietnam. Indeed. <laughs> oh, man. So, did that open your eyes at all? Was that like, okay, we're starting to get, yeah. a, we're starting to get well, an eye for the human more. terrain here in, in ways that the instructors can't explain? Yeah, everybody, I guess, knows about it. But, you know, and then, of course, how, when was, we went yeah. downstairs, you could hear, I mean, there's just a common area. Mm -hmm. and there's double bunks, and you hear people just getting it on. Welcome you to Vietnam. To have a good time, and they just go back downstairs and get a Coke. And uh, Dude, I can't imagine. I, I can't yeah, imagine. Welcome, yeah, welcome to Vietnam. Uh, but here's, here's the yeah, other thing. Go for it. When Mac and I were downstairs, um, one of the uh, hatchet force had come back and I, and I don't know if it was Delta or Mike force, but they had just come back from Ashaw Valley and they had worked on relieving one of the operations out there. And they were talking about the combat. So here's McIntyre and I green is grass. Yeah. We got 
yeah, anybody looks at it, you could tell we're just the green, green beret. Yeah. And nobody would talk to us because we're just knuckleheads. What was it? What was it? Just your demeanor, how you looked, a combination? Well, you got new fatigues. Everybody else is wearing So you're brand fatigue. new. You're, you're out of the yeah. box. Okay. Yeah. So we're rookies and we know it. And we just, your place in life there is you don't talk to anybody unless you're spoken to. Sure. That's just the way it is. So McIntyre and I talked to each other and John Hutchins was up there with us. He entertained us a little bit. He went through training group and, um, but we heard these guys talk about the combat mm. and what they've been up against in the Valley. And McIntyre looks at me again and goes, holy shit. <laughs> so the next day we got our briefing and then uh, the following day we flew up to a Fubai. Are you still feeling, I mean, I'm just curious. Are you still feeling strong? Are you still like, you're hearing about this combat, you're, especially in the Ashau? Are you, is there any kind of doubt going on? Like, man, what am I getting myself into here? Well, that's always the question that's in the back of your mind. But, yeah. hey, we got that little funny hat in our head that keeps neither the rain nor the sun out of your eyes, but you've worked hard to get it. I've heard, uh, I've heard that, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something like courage isn't just not being afraid. That's bullshit. Everybody's afraid. It's what oh, yeah. you do with it. You know, do you let it own you or do you push through it? So it sounds like, Sounds like you're pushing through it and you're getting up there. So when when is the uh, it's like the Wizard of Oz, right? They pull back the curtain and the little guy steps out. When do you finally learn what SOG is? Well, it's the next day. We went into uh, the uh, CNC command for Mac V SOG in Da Nang. Okay. And, you, and we went into this room and the uh, first thing we did, we pulled out pads and pencils and we're ready to take notes. We've been students for 15 months, right? Sure, sure. So the first thing the Sergeant Major comes down, he says, put that shit away. And he says, this is a top secret briefing. And uh, he didn't say it, but you know, like, welcome to the secret war. He didn't say that, but that was our welcome. And then he said, Every, he, and, and uh, it turns out there was a Sergeant handing out papers and those were the non-disclosure forms. And the guy handing it out was Michael Byard who I went through junior high school and high school with. We were a couple years apart. Okay. And he was from Trenton, New Jersey. He was one of six men from Trenton, New Jersey that served in SOG wow. during the Civil War. Do you yeah. know do you know if that was disproportionate to like the other states? Is it something about New oh, Jersey yeah, that's I'm sure it's just ex extraordinarily disproportionate. It shows the heroic nature of local Trentonians. Hard ass Trentonians from New Jersey. Yeah, and I have nothing done. to prove that, but, you know, that's just me here mouthing off here. <laughs> so what was that? Okay, so you put your put put the paper away. You're in this, yeah. uh, I assume the MACV compound is secure. Um, oh, yeah. And, so we're in a briefing room. Yeah. There's curtains on the windows. And the sergeant major base says, look, this is the secret world. You got a document in front of you. If you sign it, you can't talk about anything that happens from this point forward. Was there Not an expiration? Briefing, nothing in SOG. You can't tell your mother, your girlfriend, anybody. I'm sorry. Was you there an expiration date like on the form? Like on this date in this oh, year, yeah. you'll be yeah, good you to go? Sorry. So whatever it was in May of 1968, 20 years later, May of eight, 1988, we couldn't talk about it. So, okay. So just a 20 year before you hear anything. I'm sure this is just... I mean, um, just hearing how you're getting through these steps of the process and every single kind of time you get a chance to either turn back or say no, you're just like, man, well, yeah, I got to see it. I'm sure this was that point where you're like, man, this is even inciting you even more. You seem like that kind of person that this is just piquing your interest. More well, it and kicks more. up your adrenaline a step or two. Yes. And the, the sergeant major said, he said, look, if you sign it, you can stay in. If you don't want to sign it, now's the time to leave. Anybody Everybody leave? Stayed. Everybody no. stayed? Oh yeah. Okay. We've all, we'd all been in that training. And then Mike, it turns out Mike had been up there for a few months earlier. He was um, supporting some Navy SEALs. They needed some commo guys. And Mike mm -hmm. had gone through commo ahead of me at Fort Bragg, which I didn't realize at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, Mike was doing duty with the SEALs going on some of their, their fast boats that were going north. Yeah taking in some teams up there or yeah. picking up teams or down pilots and doing bright uh, light doing bright light missions up there you right okay and uh so he was doing that after he's done with that he got assigned to our communications center and uh, 
Hmm. But it's just cool to see somebody from Trent, like, like a small world scenario. So, yeah, when we're done with that, uh, the Sergeant Major came out and he pulled that curtain off the map. Hmm. And there's Vietnam on, on the right side and it has all the cities mm-hmm. and it's broken down into cores. I Corps was up north. Okay. Two core, three core, then four cores of Mekong Delta and all south. Sure, sure. And so we were in I Corps, which is Da Nang and uh, higher, anything north of Phu Bai. And that's the most northern section, correct? In South Vietnam. Gotcha, correct. gotcha, gotcha. And it's bordered up top by the DMZ. On the mm-hmm. other side of the DMZ is North Vietnam, the communist side. Yes. And to the left, you had Laos that paralleled all the way up into North Vietnam. Mm hmm. And further south, down to the uh, what they called the tri-border area, sure. where Laos and Cambodia came together with South Vietnam. Yes, yes. And there were trails, infiltration routes that came into South Vietnam off the Ho Chi Minh Trail complex. That so, came down. for the for the listeners who are who are tuning in here, um, and and aren't imminently familiar with the uh, the geography of Vietnam. Um, Vietnam has a coastline that defines its border. And then um, to the west, it is there's two different countries that uh, border um, directly up against the side of the country. And that's Laos to the north um, and then uh, Cambodia down to the south. That's that's what we're talking about here. Just so you know, um, go look at a map if, if you if you're not sure, because this is this is important going forwards. Um, so you, you see this big map of Cambodia, Laos, um, and, and of course, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, the DMZ, um, the demilitarized zone, the section between North and South Vietnam. Um, so then what, what did he have well, to no, say? Well, no, the map that? is critical. Here's a critical point on the map. Sure. South Vietnam said I core, two core, three core, four core. Mm-hmm. North of that was a DMZ, but they had target designated. So DMZ one, DMZ two, these were targets that SOG ran into the DMZ. To the west of it, in Laos, again, they're 10 by 10 target blocks. Oh, man. And everything was targets all the way down through Laos and then into Cambodia. Now, I don't remember much about Cambodia because sure. our focus we knew was going to be Laos at okay. that point. Because you were your I Corps. Yeah. So uh, immediately right there. You, I mean, you're, you're a quick guy. I'm sure you must have, as you just said, seen that immediately. Uh, supposedly, again, um, for the listeners, and, and again, uh, I apologize if, if I if I get it wrong, just come on in and get me. Um, Laos, Cambodia, the DMZ, North Vietnam, these were all supposed to be areas that were off limits to U.S. ground personnel. Um, is, is that is that correct? Neutral. Yes, they're, they're like neutral, neutral areas. Neutral. The yeah. communist and our American government had signed or had pledged to respect some kind of a truce or a treaty sure. of some sort. Sure. And I forget what the official designation, but the no bottom worries. line was like President Kennedy pulled out the Green Berets that we had in Laos and Cambodia. They came back. Mm-hmm. We had operations going on there combating the communists that were trying to overtake Laos and sure. Cambodia in um, 59, 60, 61, Operation White Star was a Green Bray operation in Laos. Mm-hmm. Kenny pulled them all out once they signed that accord. And the communists said, oh, yeah, we won't have combat troops there. North oh, Vietnam yeah, sure. will not have combat troops. Well, when I get there in 68, they had twenty five to 35,000 men in Laos alone. And in Cambodia during uh whenever they had a major offensive they would have over a hundred thousand troops oh my god that would go across the border attack our bases attack our allies and then go back and lick their wounds yeah and our conventional forces couldn't go back so they couldn't get there just to so, just again to recap so these are neutral areas the demilitarized zone um laos cambodia and um kennedy originally had guys doing their original sf uh, doctrine of going in there, working with indigenous troops, but at some point um, politically, those troops were pulled back, and these areas were deemed neutral, and uh, official U.S. presence was not to be there. But here you are, in the in the in the MACV compound, and they just pulled revealed the map, and there you have it. There are operational targets in these supposedly neutral 
off limit right. areas. And I guess that's your your introduction to the secret war. It was indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Ominous lean in. Oh, yeah. So what else did he have to say after he re revealed that map? Well, he talked about the secret war, how it was a dangerous duty mm -hmm. and how we would go in. Any mission would be no identification that we were Americans. Yeah. So he left all your dog tags, no name tags, no pictures, no love letters from your girlfriends or mom or anything. And because if you were captured or killed and they got your body, they wanted plausible deniability sure. so that they could say, hey, we don't know who this gringo is, but uh, there's no identifiers on him. Sure. And so, that was yeah. a plausible deniability factor. So everything sterile. I mean, did they, was it even like down to like, like brands of like cigarettes that guys carried? How, how deep was the sterilization that, you know, none of it could be tied back to the U.S.? Well, some guys carried cigarettes, but... If you carry cigarettes on my mission, you're going to get bit smacked. But nobody carries cigarettes to the field. Understood. Understood. Because the smoke can be smelled for miles away. Understood. And what we smoked was different than what the Laotians and the North Vietnamese Army smoked. I see. Aside from marriage of Dewana. Understood. We're just talking about tobacco here. Understood. Understood. <laughs> so, like, you're taking all the name tapes off your uniforms. You're taking all the labels off your uniforms. Um, as you can see, I kind of like, I like old military artifacts. So I'll, we don't have to get too far into it. Um, maybe right. that'll be a topic for another time, but I, I'm just curious. You're completely plausibly deniable. Um, you're everything down to your uniforms is sterilized, quote unquote, um, that nothing can tie back to the United States. Is that correct? Correct. Wow. Wow. So what I mean, else? It even got down to the point where if, uh, any American that was killed in Laos or Cambodia during the Secret War, their families would be notified that their um, sibling had died in South Vietnam. And medals of honor that were awarded for combat in Laos with yeah. Saad, Fred Zabotowski, yes. Robert Howard, all these uh, men, they, the award citation said for heroism deep in enemy territory in South Vietnam. Wow. So there, so actions of bravery um, that happened in this war, in the secret theater of the war, would go unacknowledged for what they truly were, at least for twenty years. Um, in some cases, longer. Uh, if I if I believe President Trump just gave out a Medal of Honor um, for a fellow who 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 uh, did incredible things, I believe he was a medic in in Operation Tailwind um, in Cambodia. Is that correct? Yes, and it was uh, actually it was lower uh, southern part of Laos. Oh, okay, I see. Tail win on uh, October twenty third, twenty seventeen. Mike Gary Rose received the Medal of Honor for a mission from September eleventh to the fourteenth of uh, nineteen seventy wow. in Laos. And if 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 listeners aren't familiar um, with with that particular um, action then um we have sources um i believe you sir have have some written written about this uh to extend Indeed. and published it so uh, we'll definitely get back to that and where people can find that um towards the end of the podcast here but moving forwards um so how much did you know about the origins of sog how much did you come to learn about how sog came to be and and the history of this unit um before you arrived Nothing. Mm -hmm. There's no history lessons when you're in a secret war. Sure. When you enter it, you're a participant and you only get told what there's a need to know. Mm -hmm. So secrecy is still of the utmost top priority. Everything is highly compartmentalized mm -hmm. so that uh, a one team that would be one hooch next to me would be working on a target or doing a mission prep. Sure. And we'd be working on a mission prep. And we would not know where we were going. Mm -hmm. When we came back, it would be obvious that we'd been in combat and in contact with the enemy. We would talk about general parameters, what the I enemy see. did, how to use tack air, the weather, what it was like being on the ground, et cetera. Things like that where we could try to draw common lessons to improve 
our our time on the ground. What's it like um, now as you put together um, the history of this unit? What's it like to 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 come into contact with the reality that not everybody there people people during the time were only able to speak to very narrow segments in terms of their own individual experiences or the guys that they knew or got to know. Um, what, what's right. it like trying to put that puzzle together now, um, you know, as we as we get close to 50 years and in some cases older um, beyond? Well, we're yeah, we're well beyond the 50 year mark because yeah. the war went on for 64 to 72. Mm -hmm. The secret war. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's very frustrating. And then to compound the frustration, you know, most of the special forces guys, the Green Berets are modest a lot don't want to talk about it and they're called the quiet professionals for sure. a reason you know we took satisfaction from doing a good job and we nobody went into it for medals or glory we went in to do the job to work with the best uh, unit in the army at the time probably in my opinion still the best army in the unit mm -hmm. and um just try to get the job done the best you can and go back and plan the next mission understood so what we do know is that um, relatively early in the conflict, um, officially, U.S. forces, uh, such as those, those special forces teams in Laos and, and Cambodia, were pulled back into South Vietnam, um, and they were deemed neutral territories. But the communists were still there. Um, what, to what degree are you able to, to speak about the, like, the very formation of SOG in terms of what you've come to learn you know, since since your time during that unit, since we've been able to, to investigate this more, I was I believe it wasn't until um, 1994 I read that the very last documents were declassified. Doing it was the U.S. Uh, Senate Committee for POW MIA Affairs, um, led by John Kerry, uh, Senator John Kerry at the time, um, that finally declassified the very last of the SOG documents. In terms of what you've been able to to ascertain. Um, in this relatively narrow window of time, what do you know about the very early formation of SOG? Well, um, let me just back up your tape for a second. Sure, um, sure. Because according to information we've had as recently as a few years ago, there are still some aspects of SOG that have never been on sealed. Oh, really? Yeah, and John Kerry, uh, I have a personal grudge with, with uh, the former senator mm -hmm. uh, because I don't trust him when it comes to international affairs and what his true motivations were. Sure. So we'll just move forward and Copy just that. let it be at that. But um, the, a lot of documentation came out after CNN and Time Magazine did a story on Operation Tailwind, which was completely falsified. And it, was, it had bold faced lies about it it made it appear as though the Green Berets on that mission had used um, nerve gas and other gas to kill citizens in Laos, and that there were, and they reported that there were American dissidents that the uh, Operation Tailwind was targeting in Laos at the time, which was a complete fabrication. And that never happened, and it was quickly denounced. But but part of that, and th that story came out in uh, 1998, okay. 28 years after the mission. And CNN, the Communist News Network, was trying to compete with 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. And they came out with a sensationalized, heavily edited, false story about Tailwind. Mm -hmm. As a result, there was litigation. Time and CNN paid mega bucks in sealed settlements that right. have never been known. So at that time, because of the background, sure. more documents were released. Mm -hmm. But there are still, some are, are I'm told, they're still sealed. We're working on that. Gotcha. Not hard. And when SOG closed officially, I've talked to men whose job in SOG was to go in, get all the documents, and destroy them. Cause they wanted to leave no evidence behind. They couldn't transport them. They had nowhere to take them. So like at FOB one, three, 
That was that was closed in '68. Sure. But later in the war, like CCN, Contoon, they had so much military records that the one guy in specific I talked to a few years ago, I never wrote down his name. I wish I had. Sure. He told me how they went in and they scarfed up these these reports, after action reports, other files on intel reports, and they destroyed it. They burned them. You know, um, well, part of the history is literally destroyed. As somebody who really is, you know, I I want to I want to get into military history. I want to do my best to keep make personally to keep these stories going. The first thing that comes up for me, and and this is, I I view history as a non political situation. It is what it is. Um, and and politics aside, this isn't a, a political podcast. I believe that the Vietnam War is in, remains to be incredibly divisive, but the history should never um, get in the way of appreciate, appreciating what the veterans did, should never degradate what veterans did. Um, and for me, one of the reasons I, I truly appreciate this time and why are you being so generous with your time is that for me, this history begins and ends with the veterans, um, with the people who are actually there. So I really appreciate it as... as as you let me ask you questions, we try to do our best to flush out the history here, the true history, what actually happened, um, because it's just it's just incredible. There's no reason to make up anything about this history we're getting into because it is so incredible just standing on its own two feet. So well, again, and, and the you. one key thing, the one key thing to remember, Andy, is uh, how during the entire war, mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. major battle, yes. I mean, the Vietnamese, the communists, the North Vietnamese Army, the Viet Cong, the infrastructure that supported them, uh, as well as the Russians, the Chinese, the Czechoslovakians, et cetera, that all pumped in supplies that they never could have fought that war on their own. You know, um, I, for, for people who are interested, um, I have put out on my, my website just a brief um, essay that I'd originally written for a Chinese history course, just talking about the specific facet of the Chinese involvement in, in South Vietnam. So folks can go take a look at that just to kind of start to understand that this was a, a, a very real proxy war from the communist perspective as well. And you mentioned the Czechoslovakians. So, you know, what, what have you come to learn about the, the type of support that was moving through these, again, I'm going to keep doing air quotes because the communists were there, even though they were neutral, what were, what, what kind of stuff were moving from um, you know the Soviets, China to the north, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, through Cambodia and Laos to supply that war in South Vietnam. What have you come to learn, and what did you know at the time about that kind of support? Well, they had massive support, and it was a proxy war. The difference was we admitted that we were there yes. supporting a government that did not want to be dominated or run by communists. Yes, and on a very personal level. Like the people on my team were South Vietnamese. Yeah. And they said, we know our government's corrupt. Yeah, that, that can create issues. But we prefer a corrupt government that we know to the communists. We want nothing to do with the communists. That's right. And the communists lied every time, like they do today. And they lied publicly about what their involvement was or what it wasn't. They always portrayed it as a popular uprising in the South by peasants who sure. were tired of the American, whatever they called us at the time. Sure. And it was it was all a lie because the North Vietnamese uh, with funding and troop support and training from the Russians and the Chinese particularly, um, they were there. And there were some Viet Cong units that were left over from the from World War Two with the uh, Viet Minh. Yes. Who who also fought the French and, and ousted the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu yes. in May of, of 54. Yes. And so uh, you had residual elements yes. that had experience at fighting. And aside from that, the communist apparatus was there mm -hmm. everywhere. And they would have their soldiers and they would have members of the communist party who always put the party first before anything within their troops <clears throat> or anything on a personnel level. Sure. And they and so in answer to your question, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a major effort. Yeah, it was an ever expanding effort of moving supplies, <clears throat> manpowers, tanks, trucks, bicycles, bullets, Anything. weapons, 
Yeah. And, yeah. Anything. I, South. Uh, um, for my just little article that I wrote, I mean, what I had access to was an SKS that a friend of mine picked up here at a local gun show. And it, you know, it's just obvious that this thing, it was made in 1966. I traced the serial number. It was, it was obviously a veteran bring back. This is physical evidence that you have literally the weapons being used to fight the war, being shipped down um, through these neutral countries. Um, and here you guys are. You're getting the briefing on your target areas there to, I'm, I'm assuming, to combat this flow. When did you learn that the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the movement of these supplies to to, to prop up and move this uh, this move this this communist effort forward in South Vietnam. When did you learn that that was to be your your role to re, to be in the, first, in, the, in the first briefing, the primary briefing in Da Nang, mm -hmm. and so to take your point of view more detailed. Mm -hmm. um, by '68, the secret war for an American involvement had been gone for four years. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the secret war knew the communists were lying scumbags that they are. Sure. Like they are today. Yes. If you have a press release from a communist document, government, you cannot believe what they say because their doctrine is lie and say anything to get on top of a situation. Yeah. Whereas America, at least we still, there's some people that still want to fight for and have the truth, whether it's painful or not. Absolutely. But back then, we knew that the missions, we had to find out what they were doing with 25,000 men assigned to Laos, as well as those transporting through with supplies, caches, weapons. Um, our job was area reconnaissance. Sometimes and that meant go into a target just to see what was going on. Sure. To see a trail, see what's going down. See if there was something like, there. Oh. Say yeah. again? To just see if there was something there. It's, it's like... A... Is it just completely unknown territory in some of these areas in Laos and Cambodia and the DMZ? Well, by the time we get there, there's there's very little about unknown whether there's any activity. The only question was how much and what were they doing? I see. That's why the missions varied from get a POW because the best source of intel is to capture a live POW. Absolutely. It's a uh... wiretap. Um, an area reconnaissance, which would be just to see what's going on in the area, go in and photograph enemy troop movements at night, if you could, or we couldn't take pictures. We didn't have infrared film then for that. Sure. But anything to document that and give radio reports back so they would know what's coming. And there'd be point missions that go out, blow up fuel lines. Uh, they ran uh, missions out of Contoon where they would block the Ho Chi Minh Trail, back up the traffic, and they were called slam operations. And then the Air Force would come in and destroy all the trucking right. that was being backed up. Right. But the North Vietnamese always responded quickly to that. And the team, the hatchet force from Contuna would be on the ground. They would get hammered and they would take casualties on it. So so it sounds like there's, there's two different levels here. There's uh, individual... Um, Recon teams um, in in your book you refer to them as spike teams, um, and uh, uh, there's also hatchet force um, operations. And if if I am understanding correctly, the hatchet forces um, were larger units. A spike team is only like what um, less than ten guys. Right. Uh, I usually prefer the six man team. Okay. Would be two or three Americans with three indigenous troops. And the and hatchet in my case, would be South Vietnamese. Understood. And the hatchet Some force. Team, say again. I'm sorry. And the and the hatchet force would be like what? Like it would be under the platoon level of like forty guys. It would be a platoon size operation, which could be forty men or a company size. And on a slam Understood. operations, I believe there would be a company size operation. So it'd be a lot of men on the ground, and it would take a lot of uh, support. And they took a lot of casualties. Incredible to the think. Operation Tailwind went off in September of 70. Gene McCarley was the team leader of that hatchet force, was a company. They had 16 Green Berets and 120 indigenous troops. And their mission was to take the pressure off of a CIA operation that was getting hammered further west than Laos. Wow. And um, at the, the combat was intense. And Gene kept them moving day and night. So they never settled down in one location like they did with the slam operations. 
And as a result of that, they, um, they got a, some of the most successful intel from raiding uh, enemy headquarters or supply sites, running out anybody was there, capturing any documents, um, and then destroying all the food. They had tons of food, weapons, ammunition. They destroyed it all. Wow. And not to mention the, the Medal of Honor action of, that, of the SF medic. And the reason why Mike got the Medal of Honor, he was the only medic on the ground mm -hmm. with 136 men. Wow. Actually, two or three got wounded on the insertion. So it would be 117 indigenous with 16 special forces. At the end of the mission, there were 32 Purple Hearts handed out Jeez. to those Green Berets. It's incredible to, to comprehend that you have this massive you have scale or you have excuse me you have operations up to the scale of over a hundred guys in this case uh what was 130 uh, 130 or so green berets yeah. and, and indigenous personnel operating completely um unbeknownst to the the public at the time so sog right. was um running larger missions such as that but it seems like they were mainly if i'm getting this correctly mainly doing recon teams in your case of about six men um and working out where these specific areas along you know in these neutral countries um where the enemy was what they were doing and trying to understand this critical flow of supplies into south vietnam and you said that the north vietnamese uh, reacted really quickly um and efficiently um in many cases to sog operations and and just listening to this it makes perfect sense because this is their artery this is their arterial support into south vietnam like that sks you know literally the physical weapons or training or anything um and i guess what i want to ask next is did you notice sog evolve over time while you were there did you notice that it's it's operations changed at all in terms of scope well, or execution both, both sides evolved mm -hmm. by um on our first briefings that we had in August, when we actually ran actual operations, sure. part of the briefing was that uh, they had intel reports about the North Vietnamese Army having hunter killer SOG teams. These were teams that were trained up to hunt us Whoa. and to quickly kill the Americans. Oh, man. So that was their side of it. On our side, we, uh, we knew that we were compromised we didn't realize how much on an operational sense, but we still would go in and try to get the target and do the mission uh, regardless of what it was. And of course, we were always looking for a POWs if we could find any American POW base. Uh, you, you mentioned you were you mentioned you were getting compromised. Um, now, just to kind of flesh that out for the listeners, um, do you mean that there are moles? like operating for the communists somewhere in the SOG hierarchy. There's spy counter uh, spy craft going on. Um, wh what were you aware of at the time that was compromised? Well, the time we were, what we knew was we were compromised. We didn't know to what extent. Mm. And there was at the very highest level in SOG, an individual who was from the North Vietnamese government, <sighs> who was at this highest levels. He had access to a lot of communications that he promptly fed to North Vietnam. Mm. He was awarded after the war their top honor for his time as a spy. And wow. the other thing that happened was the USS Pueblo, which was a US intelligence ship, was seized by the Koreans oh, right. in November. That's right. I forgot 19, about that. Yeah, 1967. And they still have it, and right? Then, like it's a trophy. If I remember Correct. correctly, it's still moored and maintained, and it's tr it's like a trophy uh, held by North Korea. Right, and they're proud of that. Well, uh, but see, they did it at the behest of the Russians. I see. Well, yeah. The Russians wanted them to go in to seize the ship, and then the Russians were there. When it came into port, the Russians took all the encryption, the state-of-the-art Navy encryption equipment. They took it all off the ship. They took it to Cambodia. And they set up and operated there. And then at the, at the same time, Johnny Walker spy ring was operating. He was in the Navy and he was selling the secret codes to the Russians. 
So the Russians for several years had access to the top secret communications of the Navy and the Army. So there's all kinds of uh, counter espionage working against you guys on the ground. Um, it sounds like it's the evolution that's occurring here is it's getting tougher and tougher to run recon. Well, there's ways around some of that now, but at that point, we knew we were compromised. We just didn't know how detailed and we took steps against it. I understand. So um, I guess the next thing I want to ask you about, and um, this is just, it's just absolutely necessary to get into these stories. Um, and you've written a book, you've written a few books. Um, the book I'm really want to kind of draw from here is uh, Across the Fence. Got it right here, as you can see. There's a lot of good stuff in this book. I have gone through it, and there's more than we can get into now. But I want to flush out. You, you, you detailed how, you know, yes, there's hatchet force operations, but there's a lot of small recon teams. Um, you ran a recon team of six men. You, I want to flush out what it was like for the majority of those operations using some of your incredible stories um, to, to help tell that story. Um, what was your recon team named? Oh, our, uh, and 68, all the recon teams were called spike teams. Understood. So it was spike team Idaho. And at the end of 68, they just called them RTs, recon teams, what they Understood. were. Um, and so like in our case, when Idaho got wiped out mm. and spider became the team leader, we had, to, we had to hire new South Vietnamese. And we had myself and Don Wolken that came on the team that had to learn about the team. The team had to learn about us. Wow. And Spider just worked us really hard for a few months, just training up to speed with uh, in country patrols, weapons, repelling, repelling from helicopters, even something as simple as getting in a helicopter while under fire and then exiting a helicopter, things like this yeah. that um, you wouldn't think about, but those are common SOPs within running recon that had to be trained up so that everybody knew what to do on a given situation as opposed to standing there trying to tell people what to do. Let's flesh out the organization of your typical recon team. So, um, so in your book, you detail how there's a leader, there's assistant leaders, and then in the indigenous uh, troops, they all have ranks as well. What were some of those ranks called? What were the the terms you guys used to to? to well, we're pretty those? clever, you know. The American team leader was a one zero, so our counterpart would be a zero one. Understood. So that's an American team leader is one zero, and then there's an indigenous team leader for the indigenous guys in that team, right. and, and he was you just reverse it, so he's a zero one. And so on our team was uh, Nguyen Van Sao, Sau, S A U. Okay. And he had been fighting in a secret war for two and a half years by the time I got on the team. He was uh, maybe 98 pounds soaking wet on Sunday night. Oh, man. <laughs> but it was about 50 pounds of that was just sheer heart and guts. Understood. He was a farmer, but he hated the communists and uh, he preferred uh, serving with us as opposed to a conventional unit. And then one zero is the team leader the one one was assistant team leader the one two was a radio operator except in cases where i took over the team i kept a radio myself i preferred to direct the airstrikes etc okay and um then with the indigenous troops we'd have an interpreter and then a grenadier and so on a six-man team there would be two or three americans in the beginning we usually ran three americans during the early part of putting together Idaho, reconstituting Idaho. And then after Spider left, uh, Don Wolken and I ran a couple of missions together with a third person. And then once I became the one zero in the, at the end of October of 68, uh, I had one other American on the team. And one mission, we had a strap hanger that went out with us. But basically we'd be two Americans and then four South Vietnamese sometimes maybe up to eight mm -hmm. um, because the South Vietnamese on our team were, were fearless. They were better in the jungle than we were. And they really knew the jungle. Sal had a gift for smelling the enemy. We were never ambushed. Of course, we stayed in the jungle. We didn't go down trails. We sure. go down trails, you invite an ambush. 
Understood. And we're just very fortunate to have uh, fearless uh, indigenous troops. So referencing referencing your book here, um, you got in with RT uh, ST Idaho right after the the team, the original SD Idaho had been completely wiped out. Did you guys ever, apparently they went on operation and was never heard from again. Is that correct? Right. And then two days later, a bright light went in for them. Mm. RT Oregon went in and they had one team member killed. Everybody was wounded and they were hit with American weapons and American hand grenades. Oh man. Which we draw the assumption that those, uh, materials and weapons came from ST Idaho after they were wiped out. So how many missions um, did you run with I R with uh, excuse me with ST Idaho before you ever even saw the enemy? Oh, it was quite a few because the jungle was so thick mm -hmm. that sometimes we'd have firefights where the enemy would be right on the edge and you would see the gunfire. They could see us if we were open. And then we'd be firing at the gunfire. And, you know, it was sometimes you'd only see one or two soldiers actually be in the open. Understood. Let me let me rephrase. Did you did you have missions where you just had no enemy contact at all when you were first uh, getting with our RTI, uh, ST Idaho? Yeah, the first two missions we did were uh, we inserted Air Force sensors along the Ho uh, along the Ho Chi Minh Trail mm -hmm. in the Asheville Valley. The first one was in the Asheville, the second was upside of uh, Quezon, mm. which was up north, a little Understood. further north. And it's where the combat base was earlier in 68, where they had the Marines that, that, that withstood attacks over over months, bombardments. And we had an FOB-3 up there that still ran recon missions across the fence into Laos. And they did local patrols as well to help for security purposes. And... Um, so our first two missions, and then we had a practice mission as well as an ambush at night, and we had no contact, not with the enemy. So, and then uh, that changed on uh, October seventh, sixty-eight. We had a we were in Echo Four, yeah, and uh, we were in contact for f close to four hours. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. We're about to get to that here, but apparently, I just want to just share this part. That apparently, um, you know, it was quite quite something that you had gone a number of times out with your team and had not gotten any contact. In the book here, um, it says your 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 co sogger Spider Parks <laughs> said, and I quote from the book: Spider joked with me, saying that I was one of the few people in the history of CNC to have run a practice mission and two missions and still not have a combat infantryman's badge. So it was Indeed. bound to happen. You were yeah. bound to, you knew it was coming. You knew that you were gonna be getting in contact. And in that contact definitely happens here um, on your October October uh, six and seven mission um, in Echo Four. And I'm just curious, how did you guys name the specific mission? So like, where did Echo Four come from? Well, again, you go back to the briefing and it said there are target boxes in Laos and uh, Cambodia and the DMZ. Mm -hmm. So these are all predetermined by our higher command. So when you got a target, you would get a map that would be in that 10 by 10 box. Sure. So a grid. Yes. And they would cut out that map mm -hmm. strictly for where you were. Mm -hmm. So that if you got shot or killed and they recovered your map, only thing they would have would just be that segment of the target that you were in. I see. So it's Nothing a grid more. so it's a grid pattern reference. Echo four. It's you have Correct. a numerical uh grid reference on one side, then you have alphabetical and it's echo four, and then that tells you where this is. And this right. is in Laos. A series of targets like up north there are the MA targets that sure. were along the DMZ river in Laos. Then you had the actual DMZ targets that were in the DMZ that we ran. And then as it came south, there were the golf targets, whiskey, mm -hmm. um, and a bunch of other designators. Oscar 8 was one of our worst. Understood. In the I Corps. Wow. And there was a bunch down south. They had their targets, and they were mostly all bad. Just a question of there would cool. be enemy there 
The only question was how many and yeah. how much contact would there be? So in Echo 4, um, <clears throat> the weather apparently was keeping you guys from running uh, missions for some time uh, or for a, for a period of time in there. And um, I'm just I just wanted to flush out really quickly the core, the the um, relationship that clear weather had with the success or the survival of a mission on the ground. It says here in your book, at first light on 6th October, the weather was crystal clear. In the morning, most spike team members looked west towards the mountain to check out the weather. When Wolken and I looked west, there was no question about it. The weather had broken and it was ST Idaho's turn to cross the fence into the Prairie Fire AO. Why, why did weather have such a, a deep connection with whether or not you're gonna run the mission? Well, we, we inserted into the target with helicopters. Mm -hmm. So if the helicopters can't fly, you're not gone. Okay. And then, and then more yeah. importantly, if you're on the ground and you've been inserted, uh, we had a few bad experiences where we were on the ground and the weather literally closed in on the target and the aircraft, had we made contact, could not see us or be able to see our smoke. So you're cut off. So we're, we're in Laos across the fence. There's no conventional support, no regular army units, no Marine Corps, no artillery, uh, no trucks, no tanks to support us. It would be strictly air assets if we could get them. Sure. And if we were on the ground separated. And again, my air quotes are going to come back since these are neutral. <laughs> Since these are neutral countries, you know, regular army units could be a stone's throw away or, you know, in, in the case of Laos or further. But um, regular army units, they don't even know you're there necessarily. It's completely clandestine. It's covert operations in these neutral, you know, my air quotes again, but um, countries. So you're on your own. And if there's weather coming in, you're separated from the only support you have, which are your air assets. Um, Correct. And um, there's a, a spotter aircraft working with you guys, um, referred to as Covey. Is that correct? And they're they're working correct. to help direct air assets if you need them, and they're helping you keep combo checks with uh, with your FOBs. Is, is am I getting that correct? You got it correct. And uh, again, for a more specific detail, what was unique about the Covey? There were Air Force pilots, and in '68 they were usually flying O2 Cessnas, which were a little push pull aircraft engine up front engine in the back and it was a two-seater mm -hmm. and there'd be a pilot but in the right seat there would be a solid veteran yeah somebody who had been on the ground so that when they made combo checks with us or when we made contact they were familiar with the situation in terms of what it was like to be on the ground against a communist that would do wave assaults what some of their techniques would be to help us when a team would be in contact to look for an LZ for potential extraction. I understand. So here we are, early October. Um, you've run a couple missions, no enemy contact thus far. Guys are starting to rib you for it. Um, oh, yeah. And <laughs> it's time uh, to run another mission, and you're assigned Echo 4. Um, let's, let's just start at the beginning. You get on the chopper. Um, what kind of helicopters are being used to insert you guys? We were um, we were supported by the South Vietnamese Air Force, mm -hmm. and this, there was their squad in the 219 Squadron, mm -hmm. which was their version of special operations. And they, the South Vietnamese, the majority of those pilots in '68 were just remarkable. They're as good as any American pilot. Wow. And the H-34 was an older helicopter. Okay. That an engine was set up front was a uh, B-17 nine-cylinder engine mm -hmm. that was used in World War II. So this engine was adapted to fly the helicopter, and the pilots literally sat on top of it, okay. and then the passenger compartment would be behind it, the lower level. And uh, after we used those for a while, we saw how good the pilots were. Uh, from our perspective, we liked the H-34 because it could take more hits than the UE generally. Yeah. So the, and, uh, yeah. the South Vietnamese were just absolutely fearless. They'd come get us. So on that morning, they took us up and served us into the target. And we got on the ground and uh, we'd been moving for about an hour when we thought we heard uh, North Vietnamese coming towards us so, on a wave attack. Oh, so really? we got online and had the pins pulled in the hand grenades 
and we got overrun by a what do you as we call it a flock herd of monkeys. I don't know a troop. I don't know. Yeah. Call it a company. So you're on yeah, the ground. A King B flown by the South Vietnamese uh, Air Force, um, and these King B pilots, in your book, just deserve they they deserve an incredible amount of uh, of accolade, um, incredibly heroic, oh, and absolutely. often will quite quite physically your umbilical cord to survival in more than one situation. I'm alive today thanks to King B pilots. That's all. Period. Oh. And the South Vietnamese on the team. Yeah, man. And they were fearless. Um, One of the reasons that people need to hear this history, because all too often the South Vietnamese are severely under under um, undernoted in the history of the Vietnam War. Um, you know, the, the South Vietnamese contribution, um, way more incredible than is given credit. And especially in the operations of SOG, it wasn't just Americans doing this stuff. And especially when we when we get into your book, when we get into, you know, the actual history of SOG like we are now, it's like, man, these helicopter pilots, South Vietnamese, the guys on your team, South Vietnamese, and they are all doing incredible work, incredibly heroic guys. Absolutely. And they're remarkable. And uh, there's a lot of Green Berets that are alive today, thanks to the courage and the uh, fighting abilities of the uh, our team members and the, just the heroic valor and oh, aviation yeah. skills of king b pilots no yeah. question so what's it i mean just to kind of back it up as somebody who's never been to vietnam somebody who's never been in the jungle you come in on the helicopter you come in on a king b is it difficult to find a place to put a helicopter into the jungle sometimes it is on that occasion they had had a bomb crater mm. that was near the peak of a bridge line mm -hmm. And so they went to put us in there. And uh, sometimes when you're hovering on the side of a mountain, the helicopter cannot be stabilized. So you kind of sure. moves up and down a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. And uh, on this occasion, Don Wolken went out. He was a team leader. Uh -huh. Don went out first and he disappeared. He hit the side of the bomb crater, but it was wet. We had had rain. Sure. It was muddy. So he rolled out of sight. And so the helicopter, I told him, get closer to the top of the bomb crater. He came over, and I thought I was close enough. We had a step. I'm on the step, and I jumped to get to the top of the bomb crater. It's only a few feet away. Sure. But I'm carrying 90 pounds of weight. Yes, yes. Weapons. So I went down the same thing. We tumbled down this <laughs> muddy mountain. Sure. And whereas Sal and Hep and everybody else, they got out, and they waited for us to climb back up to the mountain. But by the time I get back to the mountain, I'm beat. I'm I bet. I'm tired. It was muddy. It was frustrating. And then we got on with the mission, got overrun by the monkeys about an hour, two hours later. So you're, you're in the jungle. How does a recon team move once they, well, once the you get off triple, the LZ? It was triple canopy. Uh -huh. So that means there's three layers of separate vegetation. Mm -hmm. So you have trees, a layer of vegetation above that, and then a third layer of vegetation mm -hmm. that would mount to anywhere from 120 to 150 feet straight up. Oof. So on the ground, it's dark, not dark enough like at night, but it's darker than being out in the sunlight. Sure, sure. The ground is moist. And when a team moved, in our case, we'd always go 10 minutes and be on a slow patrol. Point man would go first. We'd follow his tracks. The tail gunner would be moving and cleaning up and covering our tracks as best he could. And that's the last man. Is, is he Vietnamese or American? Vietnamese. Understood. Now, sometimes we'd have an American back there. But again, we all knew that when we were in the jungle, the South Vietnamese were better than we were on the ground. Dude, that's, that's in my case. That's wonderful <laughs> humility. I mean, there's there's times outlined in your book where um, and just so folks know, this book is incredible, not just because it gets into you, you, John, your history. You You put an incredible amount of effort in here going into the stories of guys that you you know and have spoken with after the fact and in one of those stories um an american who's not as humble as you were and and your guys on rt st idaho he just didn't listen to his indig guys and he got he got blown away if i'm re remembering correctly um and is in a right. tragic ambush but in in your case it seems like you're 
your humility and especially your your listening to um, especially Sal, your your uh, zero one and dig uh, team leader um, counterpart saved your bacon more than once. Oh, absolutely. He was he was in the jungle. He just he had a sixth sense that uh, mm. had I stayed in the jungle for twenty years, I never would have been as keen as Sal was. He was just an amazing man. He was a farmer. He knew the land. And he was just a, a fearless warrior. He hated the communists. Yeah. And uh, when we were on the ground, we listened to Sal. We worked together always. And you're and, working uh, through your interpreter, Hep. Uh, correct. And was he the guy in the, all the photographs in your book? Again, buy the book. Because uh, there's some great <laughs> photographs. Is he the guy who's always wearing the sunglasses? Always. was <laughs> In the dim triple canopy, too. He's wearing sunglasses. He had him on. What a madman. I love it. Cool. Oh, indeed. So you guys are on the ground, Echo Four, and you're moving, and you and um, again, you're six guys, relatively cut off from everything except air support. And in Laos, it takes a while for air support to get to you, correct? Because you're so far north. Well, if you if you needed it, yes. And Understood. then uh, you know that was Covey's role. Covey would always come in for a combo check. So like once your a team's inserted, uh, within ten minutes you had to give the covey a team okay yes because the assets can only stay over the site so like the helicopters that took us out uh -huh. would begin running low on a fuel as well as a support gunship so they would turn around and go I back see. to business so you go in in a way kind of like a little convoy with a fleet of not only just your choppers but some air assets too because it seems that there are times where you don't even get off the LZ and there's already enemy troops there and you can immediately then call on for support for some gunships or some other, some armed air assets to come help you. Um, is that correct? Correct. And the, that. that air support, the other helicopters would stay back. They would not be able to target area. Understood. Because that would probably tell them right where you were. Correct. Uh -huh. And they had observers out there that would be a, a key parts that could oversee uh, the jungle from elevations and they would see which way the direction the helicopters were going sure. and they would report to the communist authorities which way we were they the helicopters were going so that'd be one of the things that uh, would be going against us right away jeez and um so we're on the ground moving through the triple canopy um and a bunch of monkeys come out of nowhere and it sounds yeah. like it gives you guys a pretty good scare what happens oh, yeah. then? Well, they overran us. No contact. No, none of them had AK forty sevens. No communist monkeys. Contact. The monkeys were neutral. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were probably the only thing that was neutral in the jungle. Um, and then uh, we just uh, reformed, moved out again, and then after a little while, um, Fook was running point, mm -hmm. and Sal was right behind him, and then Wolken was behind Sal, and they hit a bee nest. Oh. A beehive. So uh, Fook got hammered with bees, and Sal got stung. Wolken got stung. I, fortunately, I was back enough where, uh, when we saw the sign, the signals of what was going on, we got low to the ground and waited a few minutes till things settled down before we went on. So the jungle itself is throwing everything it has at you guys already. We got monkeys. We got bees. Um, right. Gnarly. And they had waiting in the vines where the vines were such that when you put your foot into it or your leg, I mean, there would be a double prong. So your leg uh, would go in like this way. Your leg goes in, but you can't get out. And you, <laughs> so you have to wait a minute to, to break it, to get it open, to get it, to get the thorn out of your leg. So I'm a city kid, you know, and I yeah. love going into, I mean, I love the desert of Eastern Oregon. I love getting out into the desert and, and as I have no idea what this is like, and it's just incredible to hear about what the physicality of the jungle is like in, 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 in Laos. So you also had some dealings with leeches, correct? Always. Ugh. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. One of the things about military history is when you get into studying about this stuff, about what guys like you did, you learn how soft you truly are in the face of it. he's like incredible and i'm just like man leeches make me gag not to mention the nva so forgive me and i'm 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 a true uh truly truly soft in comparison so you always had to deal with leeches you right 
band. Absolutely. And um, they were ever present. Um, and, uh, you know, once they once they got in, they would just suck the blood out of you until they got engorged and then they would fall off. Ugh. So um, if we found them, we put a little bug spray on them, mm -hmm. which, again, the enemy could smell if they were sure. close. Sure. And uh, it was an ongoing challenge. Understood. So getting into the book here, you're moving through. You haven't made any contact with the enemy yet. And um, it seems that I guess I'll just go from the book here because you do a great job here. Around 1,300 hours, SD Idaho broke out of the thick triple canopy jungle and emerged onto a grassy field. It felt odd being out in the open. We moved cautiously through the field with thick jungle on our right and a steep, steep drop off to our left. After a switchback, we started climbing up a fairly steep hill. In a few minutes, we covered a lot of ground because there was no thick jungle. And then I heard Sal hiss like a snake. I turned with a start and saw Sal crouched, his car 15 tucked under his arm, ready to fire. He pointed across the hill. We had just descended, descended to the narrow, grassy area, a short distance from where we had emerged from the jungle. We stood looking across the ravine at two NVA soldiers armed with AK-47s and smiles. Smiles? It appeared as if they had emerged from the jungle at the same spot we had. What the hell was going on? I'd never seen NVA soldiers so close. I'd never seen them out in the open. So there you have it. You've seen them. Apparently they're trailing you. Um, what was your reaction? WTF. That's right. Jeez. Absolutely. And then uh, we told Don, and then if, uh, we knew that they were closing in on us. And... Just to see enemy soldiers stand there smiling. And they were so tall, they could have been Chinese, but we didn't have time to ask sure. what their dialogue was. Sure, sure. Yeah, Chit chat later. Um, yeah. So they were just like standing there, just smiling at you. Do you think they were trying to, do you think they were just told to go out there and just be seen by you guys to put the fear in you guys? Do you have any idea about well, that freak occurrence when you retrospect? Know, the, the, the communist doctrine is we will fight when we want to. You know, so in this case, they weren't going to fight us on our terms. They want to fight us on their terms. So that's why we headed to high ground. I told Don and he headed us up a hill and we got to the top of a small knoll that was still a lot of triple canopy on, on two, two and a half of the sides. We had a little opening on the right. Um, that went steeply down the hill. And uh, we didn't realize there was another little area in the back that we never were attacked from, but from the right side, all the way across the front and to the left, uh, around two o'clock they hit us. Oh man, so you you get con you get you have contact, although it's, it's not, you haven't shot at each other yet. You see them, they're there, they're following you, the NVA know you're there. And uh, it's time time to get the hell out. And um, apparently, referencing from the book here, you're having trouble raising somebody on the radio. Is that correct? Yeah, it got it got pretty lonely out there. Oh man, was it? Why was it that you were unable to? Because you know, there's there's Covey above. Um, the book goes into other assets that are that are, that you can raise. What was the issue at that particular instance? Well, it's, it's just a constant. When you're ever you're on the ground. There's no guarantee you have camo from aircraft above. Mm -hmm. It's Laos. The terrain is mountainous. So um, any radio direct line, direct line of sight camo is, is limited. Mm -hmm. So you can't get a broadcast or a, a message that would go back to the east towards our... We had uh, camo bunkers set up along... Uh, key areas in the border mm -hmm. and then there were also airborne aircraft but sure you know, southeast asia was was a yeah. big ao and cubby runs out of fuel i'm sure they can't be overhead all the time correct copy so that. that's the reality of it so you had cubby there was also an airborne command ship which was the code name was hillsborough in the daytime mm -hmm. and at night it was uh um 
I'll think of it in a minute, but they had a night uh, assets that were up. So at midnight, we'd always have comma with them. Hmm. And it would be basically, they would call us and I would click the handset twice. Okay. Break comma, break comma, break squelch. And they would hear it and they would know that we were okay. So because you... the Russians had provided the South yeah. Vietnamese, North Vietnamese with extremely um, accurate radio direction finding equipment, they were able to, to vector RDS so that if we, on a radio signal, they could vector in to see where we were. It'd be like a triangulation, um, right? Um, correct. Okay, copy that. So you can't raise anybody on your radio. Um, you know the NVA are coming. What you do, uh, what Wolken does, um, as as in, in in what I see is just brilliant. Is like let's get to high ground. Let's find a defensible position because it's on. And when does it happen? When does it kick off? You guys get to this defensible position. What happens next? When do they? When did the NVA find well, out? Well, Scow and Hep could tell when they were close, and they opened fire on the NVA before the NVA hit us first. Did you know they were there when that happened? No. What happened? I was still on the radio. Understood. In fact, I had just gotten done uh, with a, you know, attempting to race a combo, both on our FM radio as well as the we had a an ultra high frequency radio that we okay. used, a NERC ten. Sure, sure. We put out a, a call on that, and nobody responded. Sure. And I just brought out a can of peaches. Was opening the process of opening up for a little snack when all hell broke loose. Oh man! So you're you're about to tuck into some some canned fruit and then all of a sudden there's just gunfire gunfight was on thing and again sal sensed the enemy approaching us and then when it, and then he and hep opened fire on them before they opened fire on us to get so we maintained the fire superiority over the enemy at all times wow so that just and that's just everybody opens fire um, in the book, you say that it's a, um, it's like a time warp that all of a sudden the jungle just erupts in gunfire and, uh, you guys gain fire, uh, superiority. And is that just everybody emptying a magazine in the team? Right. And then replacing them first before the NVA can. Right. So the reload is really, uh, crucial. So you guys initially get break contact, um, reload your weapons um, I just want to read this quickly from the book again because you put it so well. Um, a key factor in SD Idaho's favor that day was the small knoll that Wolken had driven us to. The jungle was so thick and the knoll so small that only a score of NVA could rush us at once. They weren't the fast-moving, fear-inspiring charges that the NVA were known for, successfully executing either. Here, the jungle worked against them, but the NVA kept coming. At one point, Wolken pulled me over, pointed into the jungle, and said, Look, they are stacking up the dead bodies to get to us. Hep showed me. Can you believe it? And they keep coming. Hell, if we kill enough of them, the body stack will be as high as we are. Tell me about that. Well, that you know, over time, they would come at us. We would blow them back in the jungle. They kept coming. And... I forget how long we've been on the ground. Sure. Probably at that point, had to be at least two hours or so, probably. Yeah. And um, then when Don pointed that out, because what they wanted, the NVA figured if they had enough dead bodies, they could get higher, and they wanted to get it so they could shoot down at us and get a tactical advantage. Because right now, sure. every time they came out of the jungle, we blow them back. Sure, it's straight out of Sun Tzu, you know, the Art of War, written a you know, long time ago. You have the high ground, you have tactical superiority in terms of the geography of the battlefield. And you guys have that, thanks to Wolken, uh, getting you guys up there initially. So they're coming out, you guys are you guys are hitting them with uh, Car 15 fire, um, and eventually there's enough of them getting killed that they're literally stacking up their own dead guys. Correct. Oh, man. And that kind of like gave you a reality check, just letting us know how serious they were, how dedicated they were to finding us and trying to eliminate us. And was your, were you, how big of a reality check was this for you? When Because this is your first time 
this is a hell of a first engagement with the enemy, by the way. I mean, oh yeah, how big of a reality check is this compared to what you expected it was going to be like? You'd said you'd spoken to veterans, but what was this like for you? Well, by that time, well, don't forget two days prior on October 5th, Lynn Black, with a nine-man team, came up against 10,000 NBA. Yes, yes. And that's and another so excellent that's story in this book. Yeah, yeah. So on that historic mission, they survived it because they moved, they had used the attack air, and uh, we had talked to Spider Parks, who flew Covey, and Pat Watkins. They were the Covey riders. Oh, okay. Covered, both of them covered Lynn Black that day. Numerous wow. refuels, numerous sorties, A1 Sky Raiders, and then there were other one zeros like John Walton. When he came back from the mission, when his team was overrun on August 3rd or 60th, we talked to John extensively about his experiences on the ground because the indigenous, one of the team members, the South Vietnamese guy had, uh, was shot four times. Um, hmm. The new American to the team was Tom Cunningham, who um, was shot twice by a 20 mic mic round from an A1 Sky Raider because the team was getting overrun. The team leader called in an airstrike on his own team right. to break the back of the enemy wave attack Jeez. on them. So you're already getting an understanding of the tenacity of the NVA's, you know, fighting abilities um, from, from other guys. So would you say you weren't surprised or, or how would you put it when you just see these guys well, no, stacking up their just... own dead bodies? Well, we knew, yeah, the dead body is, is like a, an independent confirmation of the dedication of the enemy combatants. Man. So you're in this situation, you still can't raise anybody. And I, I, what I'm gathering here is this, this battle at this small knoll. Um, you guys, thanks to the geography and, and your incredible skill here in terms of the amount of time you guys have spent training, you guys are holding your own as best you can. Ammo's not going to last forever, obviously. Um, how much ammo did you guys bring in with you? Well, I think I had close to 600 rounds for my car 15. That's a lot. And then I had uh, about 10, 12 rounds for my M79. So you carried a grenade launcher as well. Correct. Sawed off. So it was more compact than a conventional. And then we carried 10 to 12 hand grenades. Oh. Plus I had the radio and the battery for it. That's it. You know, c compared to conventional army loadouts um, at the time, from what I've seen in photographs and, and read about, that's a lot of ammo. So you guys went in ready um, for worst case scenarios like this, where it's worst case scenario. You can't raise anybody on the radio. You're far away from help. It's six guys versus an unknown number. Um, when were you ever able? Well, obviously, when did you when did you get radio contact um, with your lifeline? Um, At get, some point, uh, we made. Con I think we made contact with another aircraft because the uh, the emergency radio, the Air 10, had a beeper. Understood. And we could put that beeper up, and then any aircraft, any air of our Air Force, or Navy, or Marine Corps jets, had equipment to pick that up. So I think that's what happened. They heard one of the aircraft heard us, and they notified our our Airborne Command Center that uh, Hillsboro and uh, they notified Spider. And Spider came back because we always had other teams on the ground. Sure. So Spider was busy attending to the other team. And then he came over, made contact with me. We had to confirm our location on the ground in the middle of the firefights to let him know where we were so that when he got TAC air there, we could do the tactical uh, TAC air support on the ground. And uh, when, so when did that happen? When did that finally arrive? Well, it arrived shortly after Spider did. He brought him in and um, we had fast movers that dropped the 250, 500 pound bombs, A1 Sky Raiders that dropped cluster bomb units. This would be a separate strafing. And are you they directing this in? Maybe, are you, I'm sorry, are you personally directing in these airstrikes as the radio operator or are you relaying to Covey? Yes, sir. That was my job. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So um, he told us what assets we had, and then we would direct him at, on the, the sides that we had the most severe attacks from. Oh, man. And uh, we'd had gun runs, 
then the napalm. Then that was the first time that I ever smelled human flesh burning. Yeah, I bet. Napalm rods. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my. They gosh. were serious, and they and then the other thing is by '68, the NBA had developed a technique called getting close to the bell. Yeah. It would be our bell, because they knew from that experience from hearing A ones or from the helicopter gunships that when they heard them coming, they had to get close to our bell. The closer they were to us, the less chance they have of getting killed by the air assets. So right. we called in an airstrike. They'd hear it coming. They'd rush us. We'd push them back in the jungle. So then they would get hammered. Getting those airstrikes, I mean, it, it sounds as though it could be a double-edged sword. You're hitting them but they know they need to get close to you so that they can avoid because, you know, that danger close situation where, you know, you could direct in airstrikes, you know, virtually close, very close to or virtually on top of your own team. But, you know, that's a last resort. So they're going to try to get as close to you as possible to avoid getting hit with those air assets. So it sounds Correct. like as soon as those air assets come on on board, the battle just reaches a whole new level of ferocity. It does. It's, a, it's your basic death dance. Oh. So they come in and then the King Bees show up to get you out. Well, that that went on. We directed airstrikes for, I think, close to two hours. Oh, man. So you because fight we them. We had fast movers that came in with gun runs and bombs. A1 Sky Raiders. We had a cluster bomb unit run, napalm, and several gun runs. And then the gunships showed up with Scarface. And then we had the helicopter gunships that were the judge and the executioner who came out with gun runs, rocket, the 2.75 rockets, and then they returned to base. And then finally, when the King Bee came out, Captain Tin, uh, Captain Tin came out and uh, Spider found a spot where the elephant grass was only 10 to 12 feet tall. And he brought the, they told the King Bee to go in and hover and it was only maybe 10 yards, 12 yards away from us. Sure. But because the elephant grass was so thick and the enemy contact was still there, between the enemy contact trying to get through the gas to get to the helicopter, yeah. um, it took us 10 minutes. He hovered there for close to 10 minutes. I bet that was excruciating. It was. And then when you get to the uh, to the King Bee, uh, the gunships, the judge and executioner came back and they made gun runs right deadly close to our perimeter oh my god which kept kept the enemy back while we threw the guys on the helicopter and don wolken at the time we were about 220 230 he's the team dude he goes okay you got to get on the helicopter i just grabbed him by his shirt picked him up <laughs> and threw him in the helicopter oh and then i jumped up on the straddle and he grabbed me and pulled me into the chopper yeah. so this is the last light at the end of the day and Captain Tin literally hovered in that grass for at least 10 minutes. And you say in the book, you saw him at one point, and you guys are sweaty, it's chaotic. You've been, let's see, it's been a small arms battle for hours, and then directing air assets for hours, and then you say, you guys, at this point, of course, the adrenaline's going, of course. Oh, yeah. You look up, and there's Captain Tin, just cool as a cucumber. What was that like, to have that kind amazing. of guy? It's an experience I'll never forget. And... He was the epitome of the traditional King Bee pilot that we came to know and respect, who saved our bacon so many times, just oh, man. by such an example. And of course, he came back to base a day or two later and told us that that helicopter had 48 bullet holes in it, including a chunk out of one of the, of one of the rotors that was up top, had a big a round head going through it as they pulled us out. Those King Bees just can take it. Oh, they could. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. And by that point, we were out of, I threw, I fired my last magazine, the last hand grenade, and my S, my last M79 round. We, we we donated those to the NBA as we left. Just kind of weird, quick question. Did you guys just drop mags and leave them, or did you, were you trained to, you know, recover those empty mags and keep them? It would depend on how much gunfire we were on. Yeah, absolutely. At the beginning of a gunfight, we wouldn't worry about it, but any point thereafter uh we tried to police them because sure. you knew if you left them behind they would try to figure a way to to uh to use them sure. against another team or against the americans somewhere sure leave nothing behind and you guys yeah. got out of there captain tin saved your guys's asses i love it 
that he is such an, you know, again, because I've found that um, American culture, American society overlooks the South Vietnamese, you know, um, I found that they don't give enough credit to the South Vietnamese efforts in, in South Vietnam and Captain Tin is just an incredible. Well, it's typical of our media, just a failure yeah. to report on the valor. Yeah. And they would find, and again, a lot of our American veterans had really bad experiences with conventional Vietnamese units. Yeah. These are conventional American units. Again, no conventional unit ever lost a major battle. Mm -hmm. We won them all. Mm -hmm. It was just that the media didn't bother to report it that way. So what's, and our uh, South Vietnamese, there were extremely, some extremely yeah. heroic units that performed with great valor. I'm, and I'm proud to help. I bother to report about it. I'm proud to help tell that story because this is just, Thank you. I appreciate it. this is just incredible. And it couldn't have happened without them. Your, your indigenous team members, you know, often you say in your book, you just look at Sal and you can look at his eyes. And even though you don't speak the same language, that's all you need to know that something's going on, that there's Buku VC, you know, that, there, that, that there's trouble is close. So it's an integral part to this history. And again, I had to bring that up with Captain Tin hovering there, 48 bullet holes in his crate, and he's just oh, yeah. holding it. And that's incredible. Um, something I wanted to touch on here is that you get back, debrief, there's a guy... Um, in Echo 4 with you guys by the name of uh, Davison. And shortly after you guys get back, um, debrief Davison um, approaches you and he says that he, he he's not going to run recon anymore. Um, and what I really wanted to bring up was that in your book, not at all judgmental about it. Not at Never. all a problem. What was... Well, first of all, Jim came to us after one year with the 173rd. So he was already uh, a combat veteran. Oh, yeah. Jim saw a lot of combat with the herd, the 173rd. So he came to us. And at the time, we were recruiting out of the other airborne units because we were <clears throat> we needed bodies. Yeah. We had lost so many people, either from, like with Idaho, getting wiped out. Other teams had been completely wiped out. Our teams were so wounded when they came out, they had to lick their wounds and get healed. Yeah. And like with the, um, with ST Louisiana, with John Walton, with the medic on August 3rd, yeah. you know, Tom Cunningham had his leg blown off. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pete Boggs, the team leader, was wounded severely by shrapnel. Incredibly high casualties. Yes. So a lot of the casualties. So we're recruiting from other airborne units. So. Oh. You know, he came in from that from the 173rd and that day, I mean, when we were on the hill, he fought and he never backed down once. And he was a stud airborne. And I uh, absolutely. So um, he earned our respect yeah, and the respect of our little people. That's an affectionate term. Yeah, of course. And uh, when he talked to me about it, it's like, thanks for being honest. Yeah, because he didn't know what would happen the next time, nor did we. So I'd rather be honest that we got him another assignment. And, uh, you know, I talked to him about 30 years later and he told me we got it in the book. I've never been the same since that day. And I reminded him again that he, Wolk and I and Sal Hep and Fook, we had all walked where few men ever walked. We came up against hundreds of NVA and survived it. And I said, Jim, you were a part of that. Yeah. Don't ever forget it. So that's incredible. I mean, the humility present um, in, in, in your stories is something that I think is just, it's inspiring. I mean, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it. Um, and uh, I guess something that I want to, I want to ask you that came up for me when I was thinking about things to talk about and like, there's a shortage of topics, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but something that I specifically wanted to ask you, and of course, from a, a humble place, a respecting um, Davison, what made you go the other way when when men like Davison, who obviously you respect, there's nothing, of course, incredible dudes who do incredible things. What, what would you say was part of you? Because obviously this wasn't your last mission 
um, you go on to, to run quite a few missions and, and we'll get into another story here. Um, but I just had to ask, what was it about you, sir, that made that decision? Because you had the decision. You had the choice to keep running recon in this incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous secret war. Well, um, we were in America's premier fighting unit. Mm -hmm. We earned that right. We earned earned the Green Beret. Mm -hmm. As such, you're expected to conduct missions that are on that are different from conventional forces. We never realized just how different they were. And it wasn't until years later that we learned that SOG had the highest casualty rate of the entire war mm -hmm. in Vietnam in the Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we exceeded 100% casualties, meaning that there were between the men that were killed in action, like today, as I'm speaking to you, February 28th, 2021, mm -hmm. there are still 50 Green Berets in Laos alone who are still listed as, quote, missing in action. Yeah. And then there's 100 plus aviators that died supporting us. Mm -hmm. And they died at the hands of the communists who were supported by Russia, China, all their enemy bloc. Mm -hmm. So it was never, in my case, um, it was more like we're fortunate to be alive today. Respect Jim for his honesty because we were able to recruit another member who turned out to be John Shore, who was just an outstanding soldier. And John was on Idaho for three months four months and it was the most active time in my career in SOG for 19 months. And then John asked to get off the team because he had an offer for a job at headquarters. And he just was very honest about it. And again, I was like, John, his nickname was Bubba. I said, Bubba, you and I had been so many through so many missions, Christmas day, Thanksgiving day, yeah. 68, which uh, each time we were saved by helicopter pilots. Again, the King Bees with Captain Tuong on Christmas, the SOS 20th, 20th SOS Air Force Special Operations Squadron, the Green Hornets on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, when John asked to, to go, I said, go with God's blessing. Thanks for what you did with me, because he never let me down, as, never let our team down. As far as I can tell, in terms of what I've been able to learn about um, SOG, this was like a universal thing. If somebody wanted off the team, it was respected. Um, and, and, and they were, they were respected and honored for what they had done. And it was seen as, and it was seen just honesty is always the best policy. Right. And it was, and SOG was volunteer. We volunteered to serve and you could volunteer to leave anytime. Understood. And I mean, ultimately, I mean, with any organization, you don't really want people who don't want to be there anyway, because it puts other people in danger. Um, it's especially in this kind of highly, highly dangerous situation. So you mentioned you're going on to run more missions in this incredibly active period of your time at SOG. Um, and there's one story we just have to get into here. And it's uh, in early November, I believe, from what I can ascertain, um, you're on the ground and uh, you're being pursued, you're being tracked all day, um, and you hear dogs tracking you. I believe, uh, you know, I. I'm looking for a specific date here. Um, there it's isn't eluding me, <laughs> but um, this is you know early November, the best I can see. Um, and first, you hear you said that the NVA were adapting to SOG teams because it had been happening for a couple of years at this point. Fairly constant operations run by SOG to to map out the Ho Chi Minh Trail um, network in Cambodia and Laos. They'd been adapting. And they'd been putting together hunter killer teams um, specifically to combat American led teams. But there's also just a vast network of just local guys that have been coerced, um, often at gunpoint, to work for the communists because that's how the communists roll and, um, you know, help us or get killed. And these are highly trained or highly skilled woodsmen, um, you know, or just NVA soldiers who have been highly trained to track you guys down. And here we are. Um, early in, in November and uh, just going from the book here within minutes from the direction of our landing zone, we heard the first shots fired by scouts or trackers who are working with the dogs. So you hear dogs barking, 
classic like prison break almost kind of scene you hear dogs barking trailing you guys obviously you're hearing gunshots why are they shooting well they um uh they had signals to each other sure and sometimes they would signal each other and then other times they would try to push us in a direction mm. so if we were heading one way they could tell we were heading one way they would try to push us into an area like with Alabama when they got ambushed. Mm, I see. And um, on this particular mission, um, you got uh, up on a mountain here um, from the book. We're going to read. Um, the only question was, had we moved far up enough the mountain, far enough up the mountain so that the NVA couldn't reach us tonight? Welcome to the deadliest game of hide-and-seek I had ever played. We ate our dehydrated rations and shifts. At midnight, the NVA and their dogs were still coming up the mountain. At 0130 hours, Sal said he could see the lanterns approaching our team. Privately, I had been hoping that our first hour on the ground would have put enough distance between us and the NVA, but the NVA had been combating SOG recon teams for several years now. They had studied SOG team habits and reviewed previous encounters with SOG teams while using more aggressive trackers and tactics on LZs. So they're coming after you, and you can even see their lanterns uh, moving up towards you guys. Yeah, again, Sal had to climb up to the top of a 150-foot tree. <sighs> and he was able to look down the mountain, and he could see the lanterns, and we could hear the dogs coming up after us. And so... The game of hide and go seek was on. We were hiding. They were seeking. What's it like to be hunted by dogs? Uh, not not too pleasant. I'm I'm not a big dog guy to begin with, and to have those dogs. And sometimes, some of those dogs they had to be the biggest dog. It would take them a long time to bark. They would sure. go, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Even man. these communist dogs are big. What kind of tactics did you guys use to throw off dogs that were tracking you guys? Well, on that particular night there, um, we got into a, a small stream bed and we climbed straight up the mountain. We were in that bed stream bed, I forget for a period of time that it was that night because we knew that they were coming. Sal had climbed a tree earlier and told us that they were coming after us. Is it usual for so, a recon team to move at night? Yes, we normally never would. I see. But this, this called for something different. I see. Because they were coming at us with so many people. So you knew it was on, and you knew that this was extenuating circumstances, so you guys moved at night, not standard doc doctrine, and you're going through the water to throw off the scent. Correct. And then as we went up the hill in the stream area, it wasn't that deep, but it was enough water coming down. So we were going up, and we had the team going spread out, come back spread out with false trails for the dogs. <laughs> okay. And then we put down powdered mace. Oh, really? And Oh, yeah, and black pepper. So, so there's, like, chemical dog. agents you're spr sprinkling on your back trail as well. Wow. Yes, yeah, so when the dogs hit it, it would mess up their nose. Oh, yeah, I it bet. It would knock out their efficiency, their ability to smell. So any dogs were that close to us, they would hit it. It would mess them up. And so we heard at least one dog howl. So we know we got at least one dog, messed up his nose for a little while that night. And then we finally, uh, we climbed up the bank on our right, set up our RON for a night, the rest overnight spot. Sure. And I faced the creek, that, that creek bed or little stream area. The bank was maybe 10, 15 feet tall. So um, just to clarify for the listeners, um, a rest overnight, abbreviated RON, a rac acronym is RON, um, is when a recon team preferentially hasn't gotten shot out yet, um, hasn't gotten enemy contact and had to get out and they're going to stay overnight, continue the mission onto the next day, not typically moving at night because you're making a lot of noise, um, difficult to move efficiently um, and navigate at nighttime. So just sleep through the night um, and you guys, or not sleep, but but rest overnight. And um, Right. And we rotate. I mean, you know, sure. people would sleep. I see. We made sure that at least two people were awake and we rotate every two hours. So you're at your, your Ron at this stream bed on this mountain. And it's time to go to the book here. Around 0300 hours, the lanterns got low on fuel and most of the NVA finally turned around and went back down the mountain with the exception of two soldiers. 
Their lantern was out as they walked up the creek and passed us. I thought I heard one soldier speak to the other, but I wasn't sure. After they walked past, I gave Hep, who had a bad cigarette cough, a bottle of cough syrup. The damp, heavy air, the wet ground, and his wet jungle boots had irritated his throat. After a few minutes, the two NVA turned around and came back down the mountain, walking past us in complete darkness. Hep coughed. The NVA <laughs> stopped in their tracks. I stopped breathing. Based on what I could tell from listening to them, they were in the creek, just about even with where I was sitting. So to put the to set the stage here, you're sitting, you know, with your feet out in front of you, facing this creek. Are you guys like in a tight circle, all facing out, covering all the avenues of approach in your Ron? Is that how you guys are set, situated? Correct. And, and it had claymores out too. So you have, and, and for those who don't but know, not mine. I didn't have a claymore because I had the creek bed. Understood. But in the jungle, particularly on on the side, the downside of the hill, uh, we traditionally put out claymore mines. Mm. So you, so just to clarify for folks who don't know what a claymore is, if you don't get learnt, a claymore is a, um, it's a placeable mine that you can either put a fuse in, a timed fuse in, or you can lead a cable or a little cord back to what's called a clacker. And it's like you squeeze this little trigger thing and, uh, it detonates the mine. It's a powerful mine with C4 plastic explosive in the front of it's just lined with how many ball bearings? It's like hundreds of ball bearings. 500, 600 it's ball bearings. It's whoop-ass number of ball bearings. And you place those. So Ron is a fortified rest overnight position. It's not just, we're just going to hang out here tonight. So your crucial position in the Ron, because everybody has a, a sector they're covering, is you're watching the creek bed, and that's where these two NVA are. And they just heard Hep cough. What happens yeah. next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh well you know it's just here we go we don't we just wait and what's going to happen next <clears throat> and then the one guy crawled up the hill but so, he only moved when the wind blew so one of them came up to investigate he was he was curious curious george came up the hill but this guy was good he only moved when the wind blew so when the wind blew he would crawl a little bit so it, it took a while for him to get up that bank so then at some point, uh, when the wind blew, he reached out, he touched my boot, and I heard him catch his breath. And I'm sitting there with my feet spread and my car 15 pointed right at him. And to his credit, he didn't do anything. When the wind blew, he backed down the hill and eventually got down to the bottom. Him and his buddy took off. So at first light, we were out of it and we went up the mountain. So he... Uh physically touched your shoe my and, jungle boot. Uh, yes my size 10 r <laughs> <jungle boot. laughs> and uh so why didn't you blow him away right then why didn't you get let him have it with your car 15 well the game of hide and go seek nobody knew where we were except for those two guys understood and that's the only one guy really knew he hit my boot and so time was on our side so by the time he got i figured by the time he got down the mountain to their command bunker or to tell somebody. Sure. You had to get out of there. We'd have first light. And we got up maybe even a little before first light. Sure. Around first light. And we got out of there. And we moved up that mountain all day. Did I, So did the guys around you, because you guys are pretty tight in this little Ron, did they know what had just happened? No. Did When did you tell them? I told them a little bit later. I forget when and where, but it's kind of like, oh, my God. We got, we're too busy worrying about what's yeah. next. To, to focus on sure. that little idiosyncratic moment in time. So, I mean, just quick question. Do you ever think about that guy who touched your shoe? Where he is now, <laughs> what he thought, how, 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 how much he shit his pants when that happened? Do you ever think about that? Uh, no. You know, and, and the other thing about it is um, I hadn't read my book for a long time. And a few years ago, my daughter and I were driving somewhere and she had a copy. And so I told her, I said, well, go, go to, the, I told her what the page number was in this a new yeah. paragraph. I said, go to this page and just check this out. Cause she was my youngest girl. Yeah. And she started to read it. <laughs> and, 
And as she's reading it, to me, it sounded surreal. Like it was such an unreal moment, just hearing my daughter reading my story about me, which had I heard it for the first time, I would have gone WTF times two, and you didn't shoot the clown? Well, for at that time, our tactical situation. Right. Everybody would have known immediately where that gun, that there was a gunshot. Um, so I completely understand. And, and that's incredible that you bring that up, that you, you went over that with your daughter. Because um, well, she read the book. I mean, she, well, yeah. she was old enough. To, she's beginning to get a little bit curious. Yeah. About about life, and uh, it's an incredible. So, like, it's yeah. one of those moments. Well, I'm sure it's incredible also to like reconcile with people who know you, you know, as a father, people who know you, um, you know, in civilian life, to reconcile that with the things you did in Vietnam. I'm sure that's also kind of surreal in a way to you know be going through civilian life, raising your family. And then be able to tap into those stories, tap into those experiences and be like, yeah, that was me. That was my size 10 R boot. That was me. <laughs> oh, yeah, indeed. And, um, you know, whatever, whatever challenge uh, we had in life after Vietnam, none of it was as serious or as bad as anything we came up against in the Prairie Fire area of operations because nobody had AK-47s like the NBA did. So you weren't always in the Prairie Fire AO. And in your book, and apparently in SOG, uh, Laos was referred to, its code name was the Prairie Fire Area of Operations. Where did that name come from, Prairie Fire? Some some stay behind geek somewhere at this thought of the code name for it. But it's Who separate knows? It's separate from a Prairie Fire emergency. Um, and And just for people who access this history, I want to draw that distinction. What's a Prairie Fire emergency? A prairie fire emergency, once a team made contact, and then we asked for an extraction, and then we declared a prairie fire emergency, meaning we were in contact with the enemy. Any U.S. air assets that were within flying distance of our target, of where we were, mm -hmm. they would be rallied to come support us. So there were times when we had planes that were flying north for a bombing run, if they heard the prairie fire emergency, they would be able to be they routed. Divert. To come back to so us. essentially, um, some people are familiar um, with the term broken arrow. Sounds kind of like a similar thing where it's like right. anybody and everybody who can get this come on in because we're completely on our own, cut off over here in, again, air quotes, neutral layouts. Um, and we, the air power is literally your umbilical cord to survival. Indeed. So uh, eventually, uh, it seems um, that you guys um, move, and just in time for the holiday season, you guys move south to um, Cambodia. And just like how Laos is apparently uh, the Prairie Fire AO, um, it seems Cambodia has been given a, a code name Daniel Boone. And again, yes, that just that just some 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 pinhead somewhere thought ah, Daniel Boone sounds good. Some overpaid clerk somewhere just came up with it. But uh, the Daniel Boone AO became very real for you. Um, it did. So what was some of the initial differences between running recon in Laos compared to running recon in in the Daniel Boone AO? Well, the two major differences were. Um, the terrain, uh, several parts of Cambodia were much more open. Sure. Like an American forest. Oh, wow. Okay. So you could see sometimes several hundred yards through the trees, through the vegetation and whatnot. Hmm. Um, so a lot flatter than Laos. Laos is like very mountainous, correct? Or at least the area well, you were in. Parts. There's some parts of Cambodia. We get to the tri-border area where it comes together with sure. Laos. I, I never was on the ground there, but the guys that have been there talk about the mountains. Sure. So... But where we were for our targets, the brief time we were down in camp, but we were temporary duly assigned there. And uh, it was flat, it was more open, and they had no tack air. There were no fast movers and no spads. They were forbidden to use those. So the political Thanks. situation, um, the political situation was restricting the kind of assets that could be brought to bear to help you guys in Cambodia. Correct. Okay. So what we had though, was the Air Force had their uh, 20th Special Operations Squadron, the Green Hornets. Mm -hmm. They had the state-of-the-art 
UEs, which were the fastest UEs in Vietnam at the time. Sweet. They were also the most heavily armed. Yeah. And they had um, their, the way they hung their minigun, they had more flexibility with the gunfire for their minigun. So they had had miniguns on their helicopters. Yeah, minigun fire 6,000, up to 6,000 rounds a minute. Of 7.62? Just, uh, okay. Man, those are, okay. So you got minigun equipped uh, Hueys. Now, earlier, um, I I, I meant to get into this because it's just so cool. The judge and the executioner are the call signs of um, of whom? They were the 176 muskets mm-hmm. that came out of Chulai. Yeah. But over at FOB1, they were permanently assigned to our unit. Okay. They even built billets to put them up, and then they would park their helicopters at, at the Fubai Airport where they had Marines and some other air units that were there. And were they, and um, and they were gunships, correct? Correct. That's all they did was just, the muskets were gunships. Were they from the the army? Army. Yeah. 176 was the Americal division. I see. I see. And then, um, but they didn't operate down in, in, in Daniel Boone. That was, that was, uh, the Green Hornet territory. Yes. Green Hornets, the 195th, uh, there are several other units that were there, but for my tenure, when Bubba and I were down there with Idaho, we were only there about maybe 10 days. Sure. And But the Green Hornets had the slicks that inserted us, and then they had their gunships with the minigun. You know, I, 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 I it's important um, for me to flush out your air assets that are with you guys, because just like Captain Tin, um, just like the, your, your uh, King Bee pilots, the South Vietnamese King Bee pilots, these American um, chopper pilots, um, the SPADs who flew um, fixed wing uh, support for you guys up in, up in Laos, if, if I'm getting that correct, um, these guys were just as pivotal to your success and survival on the ground if you made contact as anybody else, and they can't be forgotten. Oh, yeah, correct. I mean, in the SPADs, they had the ability to stay on station for quite a while. They were designed for close air support. And they were, at the end of World War II, they were developed. Um, yeah, the A-1, out. the A-1 Sky Raider, is that, is that right? Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. And so it's a single fixed wing aircraft, um, but they're huge and they're, and they're developed to carry a lot of ordnance. Yeah, A lot of mount, bombs, napalm, oh, wow. and they could stay on station longer. So we, sure. we love them. And at the first briefing we received for that mission on Thanksgiving Day, you know, I had brownie, I had little brown spots in my pants when I was told that all we had was just going to be helicopters, like no spads, no fast movers. And I can see why but the Air Force was really on top of the game. It was flatter. Yeah. So there was different things they could do there that we yeah. couldn't do up north. I can see why you're. Uh... The pucker factor, as you, as in your book you call it, the pucker factor was big on Thanksgiving Day, uh, um, because and this was uh, was this sixty eight Thanksgiving of sixty eight. Right. So in Thanksgiving right. of sixty eight, nineteen sixty eight, you received the briefing and this quickly from the book. I could see why the pucker factor is there. Lieutenant Colonel Drake sighed and told me about his quote little problem. Well, we've got three NVA divisions that are MIA. The first, the third, and the seventh divisions, to be specific. The spooks can't find them, aerial reconnaissance can't find them, and quite frankly, we're worried as hell that they might be lining up another attack on Saigon or one of our A camps. They took a licking from us during Tet, but they're resilient, and everyone from General Abrams to the spooks are worried. And as I said earlier, welcome to Ho Nyok Tao. So you're tasked with finding three NVA divisions. Thanksgiving Day, and just so folks know, divisions like what ten thousand guys, so thirty thousand, thirty thousand NVA are out there somewhere in Daniel Boone in, in Cambodia. Yes, DIA, the DA, the boys couldn't find him. It's up to you, the six guys of uh, Spike Team Idaho, to go find them. Let's Indeed. let's get into this mission because this is incredible. Um, <laughs> where do you want to start? Well, the fun part of the mission was at the end of the briefing, which was around midnight, because we were pretty late on that. Sure. Um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Drake said, look, because this target's so bad, you're going to get up early, 
go to the launch site. But before you go into the target, we're going to bring you Thanksgiving dinner because you'll be on the ground. You'll probably miss it. Yeah. So sure enough, we got up early. First light, we're out, get flown up to the launch site at uh, Budop. And uh, we were only there a little bit. And bang, here come some helicopters with Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> so we had Thanksgiving dinner complete with cranberry. For turkey. breakfast. For breakfast. I love breakfast. it. Champions. Dude, yeah. I'm a bachelor, man. I do the same kind of thing, but it's different. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you eat what you can when you can. But anyways, <laughs> that sounds like a interesting So we had the breakfast, jumped on the helicopters, and <clears throat> I'll never forget it because they were so fast compared to the other UEs that the Army, regular Army units had. Yeah. Everything about the Air Force was like a step quicker in November of 68, in my opinion. And so we flew out. They were really nap of the earth. Uh, they did false insertions. They had what we call as a nightingale hmm. uh, device. What is and that? the nightingale device is a device that when it was triggered, it would explode, have bullets, and it would sound like a gunfight. Oh, I see. So it's so like it, a combination theory, explosive that's on a timer? Correct. And it would be designed to sound like a firefight. Really? So we went into one target. They dropped off a, a nightingale. They touched down somewhere else. So in the event that there were observers, the observers would see this helicopter go down. And right. Fire, it just go down. And then we went into our LZ. Right. Got into the jungle. They took off. And then we were on the ground. How in long Canada. How long were you guys? And we've already gone over this 10 minutes moving, 10 minutes waiting, really careful movement, um, doing your best, of course, because you're only six guys and there's what maybe 30,000 guys around you more than likely um yeah. to in your best to just... stay unobserved for for survival and to just do reconnaissance you're moving and you right. come across something big you come across what do you yeah come across? um again we were so this one was just bubba and i yeah and we had four of the ditch team members so sal was there fuck was running point mm -hmm. <clears throat> then um we had uh, two on who was their grenadier mm -hmm. and Hep and then Bubba. Yeah. And they were in the back. So we came up, there was a base camp and we could see smoke coming out of the fire. And we approached the base camp, got close to it. And then uh, Fook and Sal said they saw pots burning, not burning, but open sure, fire. Sure. There was a pot. So later we figured out that we walked into a base camp. So the Troops would pass through it. An so one active of base camp. Just yeah. left. And another division was just coming in. Oh, wow. And uh, we we're we were just really lucky on that day. And Sal now is freaked out. His eyes are big as saucers. Yeah. He said, Buku VC. And I knew that trouble was coming. And he put, I forget what was first, but we saw NBA running at Port Arms coming down into that base camp from the north and then from the south and they were coming back looking for us and they're running at port arms to get back because they had heard the helicopters yeah and they were coming for us how many guys it, would you estimate you saw at that time well initially we saw a few soldiers but they were coming back into the base camp so now we're we're doing our e and e route to get back to the lz i'm on the radio i declared a, a, an emergency there a tactical emergency so we're going to have contact soon. We made contact and then we put out Claymore mines, blew up some of the soldiers running towards us. And we had like a staggered effort going back as we held them off of M79s, car yeah. 15 fire. And we finally got back to the LZ. We blew a couple of Claymores and then we did a gun run, of course. They had their mini guns and they came quickly. And it was only mm -hmm. thanks to the speed and the skills again. The gun runs were close, danger close to us. They had different runs would go across, and they held them back long enough so we could get on a helicopter and get out. So just, <clears throat> just quickly on the book, because this is a hell of of uh, extraction. I mean, this is oh, yeah. close. You got you have a sh just a shitload of guys coming at you, ready to fight, and uh, I mean they're highly incentivized because, as you say in your book, there's a reward for killing. SOG teams, there's a serious reward for killing Americans, 
Um, what kind yeah. of rewards were these guys going to be given if they if they brought your head back? Well, they had a, they had a Kill an American award, mm. and then with that, there's some kind of bonus, <sighs> and they would be put into the uh, Communist Hall of Fame for killing an uh, American. Oh man, so they're ready. They're hungry too. They're hungry for you guys. Oh, yeah. In <clears throat> from the book, um, I signaled all clear as I approached the Green Hornet Huey and jumped into it. As the chopper started to lift out of the landing zone, several NVA burst from the woods, surprised to see our slick and a second chopper that was providing covering fire. They were gunned down instantly. As the Air Force chopper I was riding and started to lift off, in the, off the ground, an NVA soldier running at full speed burst from the thinly wooded area onto our LZ, just a little to the left of the door gunner. As the NVA soldier dug his boots into the muddy soil to stop his forward momentum, they kicked up clumps of mud. He tried to bring the muzzle of his AK-47, which was pointing skyward, to bear on our chopper. I remember watching the clumps of mud from his boots, slowly kicking upward from the rotors, as the door gunner and I hit him in the chest with a burst of gunfire. Brutal. Danger close. Absolutely brutal. So you guys got out of there. Yeah, and we got out and went back to boot up the launch site. And the Air Force guys go, hey, why don't you come on in and have a Thanksgiving uh, lunch with us? They had the Thanksgiving celebration. We went in and had Thanksgiving dinner with them. And then we got a phone call from the base saying, hey, the CEO's got to talk to you about this. And we had given them a radio report. Oh, right, but right. He wanted it up tight, up, up front. So They wanted to know about back- what you guys had seen in regards to yeah. the missing divisions. And you found him. Yeah. yeah, the good news is we found him. The bad news is we found him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and again, there's a, there's a, a saying that I've come across um, in previous interviews you've done in your book, and it's just, just another day in SOG. Indeed. You had Thanksgiving <laughs> breakfast. You went. You um, fought a division of NVA. You came out. You had Thanksgiving. Not very long. We got the hell out of there. Well, yeah. The odds were not too good. The the morning you had a you had a hell of a Thanksgiving morning, and Indeed. um, you know these these stories are incredible. You know what you folks did, South Vietnamese um, folks such as yourself, um, American Special Forces, the aviators. This co- this this cumulative effort in this covert war that's never been talked about, you know, really until very recently. And I'm, I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of that. I'm so honored to have you on to talk about this. Um, it's just, it's just so important to remember. It's, you know, it's, it's so important to, to, to give this, the space it needs to be remembered as part of our, 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 our national story. I mean, this needs to be integrated in terms of the American story. It's just too incredible to be forgotten. Um, these stories, um, this book for the listeners, we're not even scratching the surface of it, folks. Um, we we don't have the time to go through play by play to get all this out there. Um, so by all means, go get this book. These individual stories that I've gone through um, and that we're we're talking through here with uh, with John um, are, are just they're just drops in the bucket of what the SOG experience was like in Vietnam. And, uh, sir, that's why I really appreciate just going through these stories with you because it's like they're, these are so much more interesting than reading like a dry history of what SOG did. We're actually seeing events, again, these like surreal, just another day in SOG events that are going to make this history real for people today. And so that, you know, it's always remembered. So with that in mind, I just have one more, one more story. Well, that you, I've you, you forgot the punchline. Well, what's the punchline? So the punchline was, <clears throat> we went back, I got debriefed by Colonel Drake. Yeah. And he goes, come on, let's go get our Thanksgiving dinner. You can have two today. I said, <laughs> no, this is a so by the time the end of the day, I, I looked like a pregnant walrus <laughs> walking around with three Thanksgiving dinners in my belly. I'm sorry. That's, That's okay. You got it. You see, you're you looking out for me. Luck, <laughs> it's funny. It's just, it's just another day in SOG, right? Yeah. Now, here's something else, too, and, and getting back to, if you have a scale from 1 to 10 for SOG missions in terms of high degree of unbelievability yeah. or just another day in SOG, but yes. uh, for us, it would be another day, but the valor, 
of 10 being the max. Yeah. And I would rate myself at a five, maybe a six yeah. compared to the other SOG vets like Bob Howard, yeah. Medal of Honor recipient. Oh man, Bob Howard's story is incredible. Folks, you got to look that up. Um, we don't have oh, yeah. time for it These now. stories are incredible. It's in, there are in other books um, that are outstanding. Uh, Uncommon Valor, John Plaster's SOG Recon. Yeah. Or SOG. I think it's History, just, but yeah, John, I think it's just like SOG. It's just titled SOG. Yeah. Forgive me. And so these books have those stories. Yeah. And so myself, compared to like the men that earned the Medal of Honor, Lynn Black, who should have had the Medal of Honor, that yeah. was uh, from that mission on October the 5th. I mean, just amazing soldiering that they're able to survive. And those that didn't. And there's so many. There's a, more than one Green Beret that died on the LZ because he put his team on first and stayed behind. Again, it's Ballard just uncommon. So it's just such, that's my thought there, Andy. Such a privilege. It's well, just such you. a I privilege. Um, I really appreciate. You're just so generous with your time and your stories. Um, there's just one more that I saw that look in your eye. <laughs> <laughs> One more that I got to get into here, and it happened on Christmas of 1968. And um, here we are, again, just to start Christmas Day 1968 was just another day for Spike Team Idaho. Um, what was your mission that day? Um, we had a point mission to get in to see about, try to find NVA fuel lines. We'd had numerous reports from intel agencies and some pilots that had said they had seen what appeared to be an, an, a North Vietnamese communist fuel line that were coming south to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Because when they came south with their tanks, bulldozers, any motorized vehicles, they needed fuel. And they always had to carry the fuel sure. or get it somewhere else. Yeah. And they figured they had a fuel line, they could um, eliminate a lot of traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and help to expedite moving supplies and manpower north sure. or south. This is so, a, yeah, this is an interesting logistical question that is really worth looking at. I mean, I, I just, I don't want to interrupt too long. It just reminds me that I've been working on something for a while that has to do with the Alsace-Lorraine campaign in the Second World War, and Patton in the Third Army were fighting therein. Um, they were put to a secondary compared to Montgomery's forces when he did Operation Market Garden. And the reason why the uh, Eisenhower had to differentiate a primary and a secondary importance on the in the European front at that time in 1944 during World War II was the supply of fuel. And it was that there were no pipelines. Everything had to be trucked from the Normandy beaches, and there wasn't enough fuel to reach both Patton and uh, Montgomery to the north. So this idea and this true reality that the NVA obviously needed to bring this fuel south not only is it you know obvious that they're looking to create a pipeline it makes perfect sense that the u.s army is looking at this from an intelligence point of view saying if we can pinpoint where this is get an arc light in on it and, and an arc light's a b-52 strike uh, just massive amounts of ordnance being bombed on an area we can severely hamper the uh, uh communist war effort so that's what comes up for me um when when you're talking about this, I I agree. That's a, that's a, that's a good, that's a powerful analogy, uh, Andy. Thank you. Oh no worries. Oh, so, today that's that's the point mission. Um, we launched with the King B Captain Tuong took us in, and um, we were supposed to be inserted on top of a mountain ridge. Sure. And uh, for some reason, they there were reports of more anti aircraft. Um, weaponry mm -hmm. that had been brought in. We were flying along the DMZ River. Sure. We went up to the river, flew into Laos while following that. And then the target area was further west into Laos. And then we were in that little valley area and we came to a mountaintop that we were going to try to get to. Um, he turned and went up and we flew up this range, mm. steep mountains. And there was a knoll and he sat down right there. And instead of me just telling the door gunner, Hey, we got to go to the top of the mountain. We just jumped out. It landed. I thought it was closer to the top of the mountain. 
Uh, I just didn't realize because when we came in, as we're going up, we saw an observation uh, platform Ooh. with a roof on it where somebody could have been sitting. Oh man! So and, so so the so these you mentioned that there are watchers that are keeping watch, their yeah. eyes on the trail. They're also looking for helicopters, bringing in SOG team. Again, this is part of this evolution of NVA tactics to help combat SOG. And this is like a structure that's built right. in the jungle for this purpose. Correct. Wow. And so our attention had been on that. So the helicopter goes past. We're just wondering if there's anybody there with a weapon that would open up on us. We come up, we, we sit down, we're off the helicopter and the top of the helicopter, I mean, the top of the knoll had elephant grass. Mm -hmm. And to the west, it was steep. To the south, it was too steep. Mm -hmm. To the north and northwest, that little portion of that hill was too steep. Mm -hmm. So we went east. So there's just one way like to get out. I had a land from that knoll that yeah. took us in. Oh, man. So that's where we headed. And Fook was running point. And I don't know how long. We weren't on the ground too long. Yeah. And it's we'll tough to move. Contact. It's tough to move through the elephant grass, correct? Because right. it's just so, the so tall. Grass is 10, 14 feet tall. Like Shit. the Echo 4 story we talked about earlier. Yeah. It took us 10 minutes to go 10 yards. And meanwhile, making yards. a lot of noise. Right. Yeah. And we're in, it's just an insert. We're trying to be quiet, but obviously when you're in elephant grass, you're making noise. So yeah. we made some contact, we pulled back. And we had some more contact from the south, nothing heavy. Hmm. And Lynn and I had talked about it because to the northeast, there was no contact. And we had one more area that had we headed, we could have gone up, got on the mountain, and then proceeded further north. And Lynn just said, the hill's too quiet. That northeast, we made contact here. We've seen enemy down south shooting at us a little bit. It's just too quiet. Yeah. And by that time, we had thrown a couple of hand grenades down the hill. We had to firefight. We had fired a couple of M79 rounds. And um, I get a phone call from Spider Parks, who's flying a Covey. Okay. Spider goes, we got an intel report. Do not go to the northeast. Really? I say again, repeat, I did, do not go to the northeast. And I want you to acknowledge reception. So this is so I serious. Said, yes. this is I heard you. I said, what? I said, thank you. So Lynn and I said, I told Lynn what Spider just said. And we never had an intel report right. before or after while you're on the ground saying, we have an intel report. Don't go here. Because you guys are the intel. <laughs> you guys are yeah. the ones giving the intel. It's it's like, it's, it's right. yeah, it's intel. So that's the first part of the story. So now we know we can't go there. And I told Spider, let's get an extraction. We, we're done. We're compromised. We made contact. He turns the king bees around. In the meanwhile, the NVA came back at us with some um, light weapons fire. Mm -hmm. And we threw a couple more hand grenades. Well, the, between the hand grenades and the NVA, the hill got lit up with a fire. And the elephant's so the bomb, grass is the dry. The whole south side of that fire, of the hill, now became engaged in a major fire that was sweeping up to the top of our knoll. And the wind from the canyon was sweeping up. So we're now watching the fire come up. And at one point, we could see through looking down. Look, you know how the fire has heat waves in it? Yeah. At one point, we could look down. And again, we saw two NVA guys standing there with their AKs at Port Arms looking at us. Oh, shit. And we're looking at them. Now, so under the code of conduct, I mean, if you don't point the rifle at you, you're not going to shoot him right away. I mean, I wanted to, but we were also kind of busy with this damn fire. Yeah. It came up <laughs> so quick. I mean, we have ambers and ash, the heat now from the fire. It's spreading around to the west side, and, and it's coming in at us from the east now. It's coming up that hill. <clears throat> and Lynn and Bubba put down C4 to try to blow the fire back down the mountain. Oh, okay. They got singed, they got their hair was burnt and stuff like this, dealing with this flame. At the very last second, I look up, here comes the King Bee, Captain Tuon. You, you just couldn't come fly in because of the mountain and the vegetation. He had to fly sideways 
and descend sideways down. And finally, when I looked up, I saw him and I began to feel a little better because Tuong has saved me, our team twice before on misses that I remember it was specifically him. He came in, sat down, the prop wars literally held back all the flames. Now we're getting shot at, we jumped on. When he takes off, the whole hill was engulfed in flames. <sighs> so that was our possible purpose. second. Oh and, yeah. Um, you know, again, these South Vietnamese King B pilots, these incredibly oh, yeah. skilled, incredibly brave guys, and just King Bees don't rest. They're going to come get you, and that's incredible. Oh yeah, so that was the day, and then sadly we lost Captain Tuong. He he passed away in July of this year. A, this year, of last year. Did he 20. make it out of? Uh, he must have made it out of Vietnam. Did he come here to the U.S.? He came to the U.S. and was a successful businessman, but he was in the re-education camp for five years. <sighs> Captain <sighs> Tin was in the re-education camp for thirteen and a half years. His family thought he was dead. Now that's a. That's something that um, I just want to touch on really quickly. Um, the heroism of these South Vietnamese counterparts, these indigenous counterparts to you folks, is it's it's almost a tragic note that a lot of them were um, left to re-education camps in 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 once the communists took over all of Vietnam. Um, there were a lot of them were rounded up and put in these re-education camps um, for indefinite periods of time. Um, right. How many of these guys were able to make it back to the U.S.? Do you know how many were able to actually, you know, get free well, of the communism? King B, I never had a number, but I know there were several dozen. Mm -hmm. King B pilots or some of their crew members made it back. Captain Tuong, Captain Tin, Lieutenant Trung and uh, a few others that I've met over the years and at the uh, Captain Tuong's uh, memorial service, Celebration of Life, um, there were over a dozen pilots that, that showed up from uh, around the country for, to honor him. Wow. So um, I don't know, it, that's an area you just don't have the research in. Well, you know, again, sharing their story um, is as important. There is no secondary, there's no primary or secondary uh, deviation here in terms of who's more important. There, nobody was more important. This, this operational um, collaboration between the Air Force, the Marines, uh, pilots, um, you know, the South Vietnamese Air Force, um, you know, and of course the Special Forces tells this incredibly unique story in American military history. And what I find really incredible, and again, it's just an absolute privilege to help spread this story, you guys could not talk about it. 20 years, couldn't talk about it, you'd be prosecuted if you if you did. And well, let me show you how serious the government was about that. Sure. After my book came out, my dad read the book. Mm -hmm. He goes, you know, so I can never figure out why it is why this black guy came by and picked up our mail <laughs> trash no picked up our trash yeah so in trenton you you had trash pickup monday wednesday and friday yeah and you put the trash out front and the trash trucks would come by and pick it up throw the trash cans out well he saw this gentleman several times and then dad got a job at the post office because he was a milkman the bottom began to fall out of the uh, milk deliveries uh yeah service and he got a job at the post office my uncle was down there as a, cur a courier he says i saw that guy he was worked with the fbi so the government had people coming by <sighs> picking up my trash to make sure i did not violate any of the provisions of that top secret document that we signed saying we wouldn't talk about it for 20 years so um you uh, you you saw, um, in, in in retrospect, your chapter of the SOG history um, is 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 limited. Um, how did SOG end? What did that look like? What did the war for SOG look like moving into the 70s as American involvement 
uh, decreased. Um, to what level are you able to speak to that, like the end of the war for SOG? Well, there are other books written by men that have arrived after I did, like Nick Brockhausen, We Few. Mm -hmm. His book is brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a different book. It's not like a traditional history thing that puts you to sleep. Yes, I hate but, those. Yeah, but like his page 56, I read it just to, from time to time because in it, in the middle of a firefight, he insults his team members. He insults Spads, the NVA, you name it. Anybody he comes into contact or thinks about in the middle of a firefight. But to answer your direct answer, sure. all of our guys went in much heavier. By the end of 70, 71, 72, the early part of 72 until it was shut down, they were going in with RPDs, the yeah. uh, the Russian machine guns. Yeah. So, and Better they were a, like a special kind. And, and I've read in one of John Plaster's books that it was called the SOG RPD. It was a cut down <laughs> version of the RPD so that it was lighter. Um, and they would put like a piece of ceramic in the in the drum to keep the bullets from rattling around to take up the, the slop in the in the in the drum magazine. So going in heavier is an incre is, is, is a pretty good way to put that. And I assume oh, yeah. because between the compromise in Saigon between um, the NVA putting together Hunter Giller teams, um, more trail watchers, it was just getting tough, and and just less and less American forces, you know, to to support. I'm sure all those factors just resulted in just s s ex exponential increase in the danger of running recon with SOG as you move further in time. Well, clearly, and uh, just trying to get a team on the ground, and if they, if they, and if they got on. You know, like in my case, the times we talked about just being glad to get on the ground because after being shot out of targets I and know. you say, well, you got shot out of targets, but even that is really can be a life altering experience because you're fly for approximately an hour. Yeah. You get to the first target. There's enemies shooting at you. You pull up, you go to the second. There's more enemies shooting at you. Then you go to the alternate you get, and then you get shot out again. You go back and have lunch. Here's a new target go to go to this target it's just crazy it's but it is crazy it, the adrenaline rush is such that by the end of the day your ass is dragging your wagon is dragging but ready sure. to go after it the next day ready to, yeah just then, another uh, day in sog another day in sog and the key thing about all that was you know there's today and even then there's inter-service rivalries between marines yeah. naturally air force navy whatever yeah I'll tell you what, when you went across the fence, all that stopped. It was us versus the communists. And we knew they cheated, they lied, they were killers, and they were nasty people when it came yeah. to, to, to the combat. Yeah. And uh, But it was, you know, we all came together. And that was the thing about SOG, to think about Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, Air Assets, and maybe up north, maybe even Navy on occasions. Yeah, um, We worked the Navy once or twice on the DMZ, they just uh, were a little bit different than the SPADs that were assigned to SOG that ran our missions down in the Prairie Fire area and in our area. Those yeah. SPAD pilots, the last mission I ran, after the gun run, the A-1 pilot came in, he turned his aircraft enough where I could see him. Oh, wow. He was close enough that I could tell you he was smoking a Philly Cheroot. What's that? I gave him a salute. What's a Philly Cheroot? It's a cigar. Oh shit! See, I'm. Oh, shit. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon my ignorance in cigars. That's I'm okay. Sorry. Wow. And but you never got to meet these guys. Never. Um, that's kind well, and, of a and tragedy. I, it, I, I can't say ne we never met them in the first forty years, mm. but through the Special Operations Association, of which I was president from 2011 to 2014, we brought in SPAD members. We had a gentleman that came in and said, "Hey." I used to fly SOG missions. Well, cool. Whoa. We had bylaws and everything else. And uh, make a long story short, wow. we got him in. And we had so a couple reunions where Lynn Black met this bad pilot who saved his bacon on October 5th. They were about to get overrun. And a SPAD came in with a gun run that eviscerated that wave attack. And that was the same pilot the year uh two years later they made another gun run on another team that was strapped and we got to meet these guys and then we had a spad 
reunion in the, the Tennessee Museum of Aviation in Sevierville a few years back. Wow. And the pad pilots came out from Operation Tailwind and some of the SF guys were there. Gene McCrawley was the captain from Operation Tailwind, which is in Saw Chronicles Volume 1. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, we're getting a little close to the wire here. Um, I, I don't want to go too much longer. Um, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I just can't tell you how much that means. Well, I appreciate you. You've done your homework and you're the best interview since Jocko. Whew, big praise. Big praise. Jocko did his, does his homework. You like know, nobody. it's time so I, to I appreciate your, your effort to be factually accurate and you ask good questions. So I appreciate that. It's time to, you know, I, uh, I have, there's more I, I, I could get into. Um, there's just one we'll come thing. Back another day. Thank you, sir. There's just one thing I want to ask. Yeah. Um, you get into it a little bit in your book and it's after the Christmas day mission. Um, you say that mission stuck with you for a long time. Something I want to ask you with absolute respect is just when you came back home after we've just got a little bit, just a little bit into what you did and some of the things you saw, including having an NVA touch your size 10 R boot. <laughs> I just want to ask, and this is, um, this is, you know, hopefully to help maybe veterans coming home now, um, anybody who's dealing with something that's been incredibly traumatic in their life and they're moving beyond that, um, be it for good or for bad. What, what was your process coming home? What was your process? As I said earlier, you're listening or, or you're working through this book especially that, you know, NVA touching your boot story with your daughter, reconciling who you were in during the war with who you became afterwards. I really, with absolute respect and however much you want to get into it, sir, however much you're willing to talk about it, um, your process for moving forwards and, and, and becoming the man you are today. Well, um, I was very lucky. You know, um, we had a first and foremost is the family. Mm -hmm. They're there. They're you know, and we knew that they and my grandma striker were praying for us every day. And that we came home, the house's door, even though the doors were locked, uh, because uh, security in our neighborhood had changed, and uh, you had to begin locking your doors. We never locked the doors when we were kids growing up. Mm -hmm. But the family, first and foremost, the church. Some of my old buddies were there. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when I came home, I was torn. And of course, leaving the team for my, I, I went back. I returned to Vietnam, October 69, got back on Idaho, was there until April of 70. And uh, that's another story, but my time in the Seriously. army expired. So I came home, checked out, saw my sister, went skiing with her for a few days in Colorado, came back and, uh, basically went back to college. My dad got me a job driving school buses just for some chump change. And in between, you know, uh, church, returning to college, working, just to try to find a way to get back and yeah. dealing with the mental stuff. It's just saying, going from the top secret job in the world to driving school buses is a humbling experience. Yes. But you're still alive. Yes. And there's a life to live and try to get on with that life. Yeah. And, there were, and not to say that there weren't difficult moments with sure. it or, you know, uh, Lynn and I had talked about going back with the agency, but nothing ever came up. And again, this is just the way life unfolds. Mm -hmm. So I wound up working in newspapers, which I don't talk about anymore because today the media is so biased and so pathetic. Um, but that was my life. And mm -hmm. I lucked out to find a woman who was a great wife. And uh, even my, my first wife blessed us with two daughters that are to this day very near and dear They're part of our family. And uh, my life is richer with our children. Yeah. And um, so life has always been going on. And my current wife, we've been married 25 and a half years now. In fact, 
We got married on John Walton's birthday. My hey. favorite all time recon friends. Hey. And, uh, you know, that moving forward in life is the most important thing. Yeah. And just having, you know, people that even though I couldn't talk about the missions, you just say, what, well, we, we had contact and it was rough. Mm -hmm. And eventually I found a couple of SOG guys that I could talk to. It was like Tom Waskovich. He's from Trenton, New Jersey. He's one of the six Green Berets. Yeah. There have been missions across. It. And yeah. Tom saw a lot of combat. Oh, wow. On the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And Tom's just a stud. Yeah. And he's an officer on top of it, but a really good recon man. And he ran hatchet for us. He ran a slam operation out there. Wow. Uh, he earned his pay. Yeah. But Tom, I could talk to. Yeah. We talked to talk. We, we had a little bar we always meet at, get in the corner, get together for lunch another corner so we talk we could talk our stuff without anybody yes. worrying about it or yes. hearing what we're saying and that really helped to have a release you know and the plus you're reading about the sante raid oh god i want to go back you know, <laughs> yeah. like i was gonna ask you about i was gonna i was well i wasn't it wasn't on my roster here of things to ask you about but i was thinking in the back of my mind, man i want to talk with john striker meyer about sante uh there's an incredible book i've read it's called Bright Light. Um, I forget the author's name, but he's a m military historian. The entire book, I'm going to do, a, I'm planning to do a podcast on. I've been pre preparing for this interview for some time now. So my podcasts have kind of um, taken a hiatus. Um, but um, there's this incredible book and it's a tough book to read. I it mean, is. it's hundreds of pages and not that I'm scared of hundred page books. What I'm saying is the majority of this book is stories just like that only on a lesser scale they dragged their feet they took too long for one reason or another and the prisoner slipped away from them and the pow mia um, story one of the reasons i'm so i'm really a fan of that flag you have in the background um, because we need to remember that guys were left behind um, we need to understand what the communists how they treated um american pow south vietnamese pow's um the sad fact that a lot of these brave brave men such as the king bee pilots the men um, who operated on recon teams uh, were, were subjugated to horrible re-education camps this is all history that needs to be remembered and taught um, and we need to learn from it and moving forwards we need to learn from it so yeah, uh, is a good book. I've never read, I've never completely read it. In fact, I brutal. got a pack and I, I got a pack somewhere. I haven't finished unpacking yet. Bro, you I just moved. I understand it. This all just came together. Just like, um, on Sunday, I went and got like my bed frame from my mom's basement. It's just finally coming together. So I completely understand, you know, uh, bright lights, a tough book to push through, but, um, I want to just go ahead here, tire off. Sir, it's time for you to tell the people what your current mission is, what your current projects are. Um, what is the what's like this podcast situation um, with with Jocko Willink? Are you going to be putting out some podcasts, uh, some Sog Chronicle podcasts uh, through his distribution? Yes, um, Sweet. I'm going to begin hopefully within the next uh, week or so. I'm going to begin recording uh, what Jocko is going to call Sog Cast. Oh, sweet. I'm going to interview SOG members for Jocko. The world needs it. And then I'll turn them over to Jocko. He's going to post them on his website. The world his needs social, it. All his social media. Jocko, um, I've listened to his podcast uh, for a couple of years now. Um, I mean, back since he was like level, like podcast 70 was when I like first started tuning in. And when I was, uh, you know, not going to get too much into it. Big help to me. Big guy, a uh, big presence in terms of what it motivated me to start doing podcasts and pursue my dreams. Get motivated, get after it, as Jocko would say. If oh, guys yeah. want to get some, get some, get some, Jocko. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. A, <laughs> I, I don't have the deep masculine voice or Echo Charles's guns, but you know what? Right. I'm I'm here. I'm doing my mm. thing. Jocko um, has done an incredible job putting together a podcast um, series that not only gets into motivation, gets into fitness, gets into just, you know, how to be your best self. Jocko has done an incredible amount of military history uh, work as, as kind of a product of that. 
incredible respect from me. Um, as I said, a big motivation. So people can find you on an up and coming um, SOGcast. That's pretty cool. Indeed, it'll be it'll be on Jocko's uh, social media, and uh, the uh, you know and another thing about Jocko that makes him unique from a lot of other podcasters yeah. is. You know, he had two tours of duty in Iraq. Yes, as as a Navy SEAL. Yeah, and with um, uh, the retaking of Ramadi, mm-hmm. Jocko was the officer in charge for Task Force Bruiser, mm-hmm. and that was they lost good men there. And uh, like, if you look at the interview with Johnny Kim, I was just I watching that. Two oh one. Yes. Two oh one. Right. Just watching that one. Incredible, and how it starts is with Jocko and him talking about yeah. Ramadi. And so he really n- understands and appreciates fierce combat. Yeah. And uh, it's been a real honor working with him. And it's uh, humbling. Since- I'll tell you that right yes, now. So. It's, oh, yeah, absolutely. And he's so humble. And again, that's a big part of what he has to say is be humble and everything. Be that silent professional. Absolutely. Uh, we can also find you, sir. Uh Sog Chronicles, tell us about your your Well, we have three books. We have three books. Across the Fence is the first, and then I redid that. We have the expanded edition where we added 50 photographs, we added three chapters, and some more information. Yeah, that's what I got. That's what I got right here. Yes, sir. The second copy is uh, On the Ground, and that was co-authored with fellow recon man, John Peters. And John worked on some of his chapters. He helped rewrite a few of mine. He's just an excellent writer. Sweet. And uh, so those books are both out now as through Amazon. They're available as eBooks, and they're both available as audio books now. Saw Chronicles Volume One. The center of story there is uh, Operation Tailwind. And we've delved kind of briefly into that. And I mentioned it's late. Best. I mentioned earlier. Um, if people were to want to learn more about Operation Tailwind in depth, we would allude to a source. Tell us, where do we get your book? Where do we buy it? Where, how do we give all, you our all, hard-earned money? They're all available on Amazon. Booyah. Just go to Amazon. It's the quickest way. The uh, the ebook is less expensive. Copy that. You buy them there. Um, and the other thing that about operate, I mean, the Saw Chronicles Volume 1 is we have a story about Cliff Newman, who... He was the one zero for the first recon team to halo into Laos on a prairie fire mission. And even though they had issues, they were able to get on the ground and get each man out alive. Yes. But more importantly, Cliff was on a bright light where a recon team, RT intruder had been in a target. Three Americans were getting lifted out of a target on ropes by the 101st Airborne, one of the Americans, Sammy Hernandez, hit a tree or something and fell out of the rope in the harness. He fell to the ground, knocked unconscious. His shoulder was dislocated. As the helicopter continued to ascend, it was hit by some kind of severe anti-aircraft. Sure, sure. Flipped the aircraft over and it crashed into a into the side of a mountain, killing the remaining two Green Berets on the rope and the entire air crew. Um, Sammy hid under, he, he woke up, he hid in some brush for the night. And then before, and he got up either that night or in the morning, his shoulder was dislocated. So he had to, he had to pop his shoulder back in by banging oh. it against the tree. Saw guys, I swear. I know, Sammy's oh. just an amazing man. Man. Um, so Sammy, the next morning, Covey came out. Sure. He flashed his panel. They saw him. They were able to pull Sammy out. And then the bright light team went back in. And Cliff Newman was on that bright light. Mm -hmm. And Cliff has since gone back with DPAA twice now in an effort to get to the remains of those six men that were left in that crash. And I think Sammy may have gone back on the bright light. I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to misquote myself here. It's okay. I appreciate it. That's just another story that's in Sog Chronicles Volume One. Yeah. And then answering your question, we're doing the Sog podcast with Jocko, and we'll begin working on uh, Sog Chronicles Volume Two. I love that. In you know, the next few weeks. I'm somebody. Um, my mission in life um, 
I so far it's a young life. I'm not too far into it. Um, but so far, something I just can't move away from is just the incredible nature of military history. Making sure it's never forgotten. Making sure veterans such as yourself are given a platform to tell your stories. Um, all too often, I come across stories where um, my kind of historical instinct goes, I know there's a bigger story here, but unfortunately it's been lost because, you know, World War I, all those veterans are gone. World War II, those veterans are going fast. Um, it's, it's sad, but it's just the way things are. Um, again, this is the last time I'm going to say it because we're ending it. Um, I can't say it enough. It is a privilege, sir, to have you on. You've been so generous with your time. This is like, it's big for well, me. And I you. really I was, appreciate it. Well, I appreciate your due diligence, Andy. Um, you know, so uh, I thank you for doing your homework in a really meticulous fashion and it made the three hours a quick three hours. I know. I saw that and I was like, damn, I, I should probably wrap this up. So well, see, you just committed another Jockoism. <laughs> How so? The first episode we had, we went almost three hours before Jocko looked at his watch. It went by so fast. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I had, I, I asked my dad, um, I asked my dad if he could find an old photograph of me because when I was sixteen or seventeen, mm -hmm. I, we had a local military vehicle, the Oregon Military Vehicle Collectors Association, um, gets together at a local National Guard base every summer. And all the World War II reenactors who saw Saving Private Ryan show up and they all sit around and like eat their, you know, reproduction rations and, and hang out by the campfire. And after going to this thing as like a 15 year old, 16 year old kid, I thought, where the hell are all the Vietnam guys? I had just gotten v uh, John Plaster's book. Um, I'd read it. I'd fallen in love with this, you know, untold history that was just starting to emerge. And I thought, well, screw it. You know, I'm going to get together like a Vietnam impression of like what these guys would have worn and I'm going to represent. So I went to, I painted up my face. It was, it was kind of cringy, my friend. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I was 16, 17 at the time. I don't know if I could do it again. I, I looking back on this, I cringe, but I went and I was like a sore thumb. I like had my, I had like a BB gun uh, made in Japan cause they can't have real guns, super realistic car 15 guys were like what's the twist rate on your car 15 and i'm like it's a bb gun man I, I, it's not real <laughs> but anyways i was the only i was like i went and i was the only vietnam guy saw kind of looking dude and the idea that you know i got to one day get three hours of time from um, a real live one zero is incredible um but i said i wasn't going to do it anymore it's been an absolute privilege um, I'm going to do everything I can to spread your story, uh, the story of the people who served alongside you. Um, and just, it's yeah, just, it's, this, most of their stories are better than mine. Dude. It, and as I said, this book is like, I mean, at least half of it's other people's stories. And, and, you know, that's something I've also noticed in, in SOG literature is, is you guys are so intent on sharing each other's stories. Um, it's just such a blessing to be able to still work with you guys and um, I got to end this podcast because if I go too long, I'm sure your wife will be like, you can never work with this guy again. He took Indeed, you all day. So it's from it's really it's selfish. Andy alert. It's selfish reasons, really, that I'm <laughs> letting you go, sir. All right. Well, thank you. Let's uh, let's just stick around really quickly um, after yeah. this and we'll do a debrief. But I am Andy. This was Modern Military History dot com uh, Modern Military History podcast. We spoke with John Stryker Meyer. Find him at SOG Chronicles, the SOG cast. Um, you can find the SOG cast through Jocko Willink, his uh, Instagram. Uh, I will post below. Um, everybody, thank you for tuning in and listening to this. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, John, thank you, sir, for coming on.